Well, hello everyone and uh, welcome to the, uh, I think, sixth meeting of the uh, committee, the National Academies Committee charged with uh, developing a long-term strategy for low-dose radiation research in uh, the United States. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a few administrative comments. Uh, when you're not speaking, uh, please mute your audio. And uh, just to remind everyone, the uh, question and answer session after each of our presentations is really for Academy uh, uh, members and the staff members. And um, if you uh, do have a question, please raise your hand and I'll call on your uh, name uh, to uh, begin the discussion. Uh, we are not going to be entertaining questions from the audience uh, through the uh, chat function today, uh, but we will have a uh, time beginning at four o'clock today for public comment. And for those of you uh, uh, who are not committee members and wish to speak, we hope that you'll limit your comments to about five minutes to allow time for everyone to uh, make their uh, uh, presentations. Uh, Public comments are welcome during this period or any time. And so if you have uh, things that you would like to bring to the attention of the uh, committee, uh, please email them to Aranya Costi at the uh, email address that's indicated on the slide here. And just to remind everyone, the meeting is being recorded and will be available for viewing uh, at a later time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just to remind everybody that uh, we hope to uh, keep the uh, information gathering sessions uh, in informative, informal, and civil. And so we appreciate your uh, cooperation in making that happen. Next slide. Uh, I'm Joe Gray. I'm the uh, privilege to uh, chair the committee. And uh, again, our uh, task is to develop a long-term strategy for low-dose radiation research uh, in the United States. Next slide. Uh, we have a very distinguished committee uh, comprised of individuals from with a variety of uh, uh, areas of expertise. Uh, they're indicated on this slide. Uh, and if you would uh, like to find out uh, more detail about their uh, various backgrounds, uh, those are the bio sketches are available at the uh, uh, URL that's listed at the bottom of the slide here. Next slide. The committee that uh, is uh, taking on this task was selected by the National Academy. And um, it's, they, were, they were really picked um, to have the expertise needed to accomplish the goals and um, uh, be sure that the uh, uh, Academy uh, and the committee have reviewed the conflicts of interest. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, so far uh, we have uh, dealt with those as appropriate. A screening for conflicts of interest continue throughout the life cycle of the project. And so for the present committee, the academies have judged that the committee is free of conflict of interest, that they do have the appropriate range of expertise for the task, uh, and that they have a balance of perspectives so that we can uh, carry out the charge objectively and uh, credibly. Next slide. So we received our charge uh, through the Consolidation Appropriation Act of 2021, uh, you know, which really directed the uh, Secretary of Energy to carry out a low-dose uh, research program, uh, both low-dose and low-dose rate, uh, really to understand, to increase the uh, scientific understanding and to reduce uncertainties associated with uh, the effects of exposure to radiation uh, and to improve risk assessment and risk management methods. Uh, with respect to radiation. And in particular, the secretary was directed to enter into an agreement with the National Academies of Sciences to develop a long-term strategic and prioritized research agenda. And uh, that is what this committee is charged with doing. So that's where our uh, charter came from. Next slide. Uh, this has uh, evolved into a statement of seven tasks that the committee is uh, addressing, defining the health and safety issues, identifying current scientific challenges, assessing the status of current low-dose radiation research, recommending long-term strategic and prioritized research agenda, uh, defining the essential components of the program, addressing aspects of coordination, and identifying potential monetary and health-related impacts to uh, many different uh, uh, interested communities. 
We are well along in that process and uh, the exercise today uh, really is part of our information gathering uh, exercise. We've already heard from over 70 presenters and we'll end up hearing from about 80 such individuals before the uh, 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 committee concludes its work. Next slide, please. We are on an aggressive uh, schedule. Uh, the, Enterprise was started in March of uh, this year. Uh, the committee was selected in the May-June timeframe and we began work in uh, July. And we're well along in the process of uh, discussing uh, the task and gathering information and, and uh, beginning to draft a final report. Uh, we hope that the uh, final report uh, will be available in uh, February for uh, review by the academies, um, an independent committee, uh, and that the report will uh, be released sometime in uh, April of 2022. And uh, it's worth noting that uh, when the report is released, there will be a 15-day uh, public comment period uh, where uh, anyone is welcome to read and uh, uh, comment on the report. And that information will be uh, made available uh, in, with the final report uh, when it's uh, released. Next slide. So the uh, report review process is actually quite rigorous. Rigorous. It's a hallmark of the National Academies, and it really distinguishes the academies from other organizations uh, offering advice. Uh, the report is intended to be independent of the sponsoring agencies. Uh, and it will be reviewed after it's prepared by our committee by an external and diverse group of experts. And uh, the reviewers are going to be asked to determine whether or not uh, the evidence uh, and uh, recommendations that are uh, presented in the report are uh, fully responsive to the charge uh, and are uh, properly supported. The names of the affiliations of the participants in the review process are made public when the report is released, but their uh, comments individually will remain confidential. And I think it's very important for everybody to appreciate the fact that the sponsors uh, of the uh, study do not have an opportunity to see the report during the process or otherwise uh, influence uh, its content. So it is uh, done uh, with their support, uh, but not with their guidance. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, there may be uh, uh, comments uh, that many of you will have or suggestions about uh, other things that we should be thinking about. Uh, the best way to bring that information to our attention is by contacting uh, Rania Costi, whose uh, email uh, address and phone number are listed uh, on this slide. And uh, so with that, I think um, I've made the introductory comments and we now need to uh, turn to the information gathering part of the uh, uh, program. And our first uh, exercise is to hear from a panel of three speakers who will um, talk to us about lessons that uh, they've learned uh, in research from other areas, particularly in the area of air pollution, but uh, not limited to that. Uh, we have uh, three panelists, Daniel Kruski from uh, the University of Ottawa, John Samet from the Colorado School of Public Health, and Francesca Domenici from uh, the uh, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Uh, they will each present um, uh, remarks in about, for about 15 minutes. Uh, and at the end of that, we'll have a discussion of all three presentations. So if you have burning questions, ask as you go along, but otherwise we'll hold the uh, discussions uh, to the end. So with that, uh, let me uh, turn the uh, podium over to uh, Daniel and uh, ask uh, you to present your uh, remarks. We really appreciate your taking the time to uh, join us today. Then you need to unmute. I have unmuted myself, thank you. Um, let me begin just by thanking Dr. Uh, Gray and Dr. Costi for the opportunity to offer some of my own perspectives on uh, development of a long-term strategy for low-dose radiation research in the United States. So what I'll do is talk to you uh, briefly about some advances in risk science that may be of general relevance to your charge. I want to bring in some uh, new results on key characteristics of human carcinogens, particularly uh, radiation uh, agents. 
uh, talk a little bit about some of our epidemiological work on ionizing radiation in medical contexts, occupational and environmental exposures. A project we did on radiation hermesis, looking at over 800 animal experiments uh, on that and finishing up with uh, a couple of comments on the importance of evidence integration and value of information. So some of the advances in risk science that can be helpful to us if we go back to uh, the NRC report in 2007, which I had the privilege of uh, chairing, Toxicity Testing in the 21st Century, laid out a, a bold vision for how to apply new toxicity testing approaches to better inform uh, risk issues of chemical and radiological agents that was followed by, we, that became known as TT21C. So I'm going to name the 2012 follow-up report on exposure science, ES21C, Exposure Science in the 21st Century, which looked at new ways to characterize exposure and the most recent contribution that Dr. Samet uh, shared on how far we've come since 2007 and how can we use the best available science to do the best job in risk assessment. A parallel activity that I worked on with the US Environmental Protection Agency was a project to develop a framework for the next generation of risk science. This was a large project with extensive consultation the two main outputs that I would point the committee to is our 2014 paper in uh, environmental health perspectives. And I'll show you the paradigm that we developed on my next slide for that. Um, and then there's a follow-up more detailed report, which is the a synopsis of the entire EPA report on this initiative. So the framework that we developed for the next generation of risk science is shown on the left panel here. It incorporates all of the new science that we had been talking about uh, over the last uh, decade. It brings in a uh, uh, advanced risk assessment methodologies, uh, the 2009 NRC report on science and decisions being a prototype for that. And it also took a population health approach, looking not just at one agent and one outcome, i.e. radiation and lung cancer, for example, but all of the other determinants of that outcome and how they might interact with the agent of interest. This is a population health approach that we pioneered at the McLaughlin Center at the University of Ottawa, and then multiple interventions of a regulatory and non-regulatory nature to manage risks is all, also part of the population health paradigm. I want to draw uh, the, the, the committee's attention to the problem formulation uh, step. This has become a key component of modern risk assessment paradigms and also to value of information, which I'll talk about in, in my last slide, uh, second last slide, um, what value is additional information that we might gather to meet the uh, charge at hand? This is a framework that I've adapted from a nice paper by Dr. Mel Anderson published in Altex uh, a couple of years ago on how to use the, the new scientific approaches, so-called new approach methodology, methodologies, they're kind of taxonomized into four levels, uh, different applications. So this could be useful background information for determining if any of these approaches would be relevant for the program that's being developed at the present time. Um, my next topic uh, is key characteristics of human carcinogens. Um, there's a very nice publication by the International Research Re Agency for Research on Cancer uh, IARC scientific publication number 165, which has a lot of detail on what we've learned on uh, mechanisms of human cancer over the last 50 years. And it's built on the uh, 10 key characteristics of human carcinogens articulated by Martin Smith. Um, what I did in my group at the University of Ottawa was evaluate these 10 key characteristics by going to fundamental biological events uh, toxicological indicators that would represent these key characteristics for every one of the uh, IARC uh, group one carcinogens, agents that IARC has determined to be uh, clearly causes of human cancer. And we've shown the distribution of key characteristics in this slide for various types of uh, carcinogen. So radiation is shown in the bottom left. These are the 10 key characteristics. And um, 100% uh, of the radiation agents are showing uh, multiple key characteristics such as uh, uh, genotoxicity and uh, altered uh, DNA repair rates. 
Um, and the pattern of key characteristics for radiation agents is notably different from that for chemical agents shown in the bottom right. And the pattern for chemicals coincidentally is somewhat similar to that for pharmaceuticals, which are also chemicals. So these key characteristics could inform uh, dose related assessments that the committee would be interested in. A couple of brief words on exposure to ionizing radiation. This won't be new to the committee, but I want to make uh, a couple of points. Medical exposures, particularly uh, CT scans and uh, environmental radon constitute a very high um, a portion of our total annual exposure to, to radiation. And I'm wondering whether these two sources of exposure, radon and uh, medical diagnostic procedures, particularly CT, could be rich sources of data for epidemiological risk assessment. I'll point uh, uh, the committee's attention to a recent paper which does use medical records to document an increased risk um, of uh, leukemia and brain tumors associated with pediatric uh, CT scans. Um, and I'd also like to generalize this theme that the use of electronic health records can really be a uh, very useful way of identifying risks in real, under real world conditions, large populations at low exposures. We've had great success in using a database assembled by a Cerner Corporation, which now contains electronic medical records on over 100 million patients in the US going back in some cases uh, 10 or 15 uh, years. So this is a paper that we've just published this year on a pharma pharmacovigilance issue looking at quinolones and acute liver failure, but the same sort of analyses could be done with these big databases uh, and others as well, uh, looking at uh, radiological exposures used in medicine. I want to highlight the importance of radiation dose registers in radiation risk assessment. Uh, we have a paper uh, which talks about this in general, going back some time when I used to work uh, very actively in this area. And we also have done two analyses of the National Dose Register of Canada. The first one on the top slide is on cancer incidence. The second one is on cancer, uh, sorry, the first one is on cancer mortality. The second one is cancer incident. incidence. We now have almost eight or 900,000 people with measured exposures to radiation in occupational environments comprising well over 80 different job categories dating as far back as the 1950s, if you can link that individualized exposure data with uh, individualized outcome, outcome data, which we did, first to the Canadian uh, Mortality Database at the national level, and second to the Canadian Cancer Incidence Database at the national level, we were able to establish uh, associations between occupational radiation exposure and a number of different types of cancer. And, with the large sample sizes that you have here, the measured exposures, the well-determined outcomes, this can really be a fruitful line of epidemiological investigation uh, for risk assessment uh, purposes. I also wanna mention some work that we've done on the National Dose Registry using biologically based radiation risk models as opposed to empirical or statistical uh, models. So we took the, the simple two-stage clone expansion model of uh, carcinogenesis and fit that model to data from the National Dose Register. It's summarized in uh, this publication. And the thing that um, I want to draw attention to is this is a nice way to uh, try and understand dose rate effects because we were able to compare long-term low-level exposures in occupational environments as recorded in the National Dose Registry of Canada with higher uh, and, and almost instantaneous exposures uh, experienced by the atomic bomb survivors and show that this uh, two-stage model that we fit to the, to the data from the Canadian National Dose Registry actually uh, showed a compatibility between these two data sources uh, uh, after adjusting for dose rate effects within the context of the biologically-based model. I've also spent some time wondering about radiation hormesis. I've heard lots of presentations on this, listened to different uh, perspectives, and, 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 and uh, I thought, well, why don't we take a look at just what the empirical data have to say on this issue? 
And the way we did that is we assembled a database of all of the animal experiments exposed to radiation, involving radiation exposure that we could find. And we ended up with about 800 experiments with uh, different types of radiation in different species via different routes of exposure. So it's a pretty big database. It was a, a labor of love to put this together over a period of years. And then we went through and analyzed the data and asked the question in a meta-analysis, do we see U-shaped dose response curves with a decrease in risk at low doses followed by an increase in risk at moderate to high doses more often than we would expect by chance? And the answer was, well, maybe, maybe not. There was actually little empirical evidence that was uh, convincing. But at the same time, uh, because the, uh, the number of data points in the very low dose region wasn't as great as we would have liked, there is a question of whether we got enough power to really address that question empirically in an adequate manner. Uh, the other example I wanted to turn to where we've had some successes with low dose radiation exposures is residential radon. And um, we were aware of radon a long time ago. Uh, and did uh, one of the very first large scale case control studies on radon in homes and lung cancer in Winnipeg, Canada, which is the city with the highest average radon exposures, which is why we chose it. Large, large case control study, 1500 subjects, uh, uh, extensive exposure monitoring. Every house that every subject lived in throughout their entire lives, cases and controls, was measured with one year integrated CR39 alpha track uh, 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 detectors. At the end of the day, we found no clear association. We put that data, however, with uh, six other studies from the United States in a combined analysis, and we actually were able to tease out a, uh, a, a significant increase in lung cancer risk at residential exposure levels, ranging from one to 200 becquerels per cubic meter, uh, with the combined data showing the power of uh, pooling data from multiple sources. And I can Talk, talk to you afterwards, if, if you like, about why we didn't pick this up in the first study that we did in Winnipeg, why I think that's the case. Um, and one other point about this slide is if we look at the, all of the data, and then we look at a subset of the data where we had our best exposure uh, measurements, more complete exposure measurements, we get an increase in the signal. And the, the, the risk estimate goes from about 11% excess uh, risk per 100 becquerels per cubic meter to about 18%. And you'll see this is a theme that uh, adjusting for exposure measurement error can actually sharpen estimates of risk in, in these kinds of studies. So one of the questions I was asked to talk about is lessons learned from other uh, endeavors such as air pollution epidemiology. We worked uh, a number of years ago on a reanalysis of the famous Harvard Six City study and a similar study based on the American Cancer Society cohort, which has a million people followed for 25 years now. And what we did was we developed smooth creed uh, spatial representations of air pollution services across the United States and use those ecologic exposure measures to actually estimate the risk in the ACS cohort where we had individual data and we could uh, adjust for individual uh, covariates like tobacco smoking and, and, and others. And we were able to identify a clear uh, risk with these ecologic exposure metrics associated with air pollution. Um, I have a summary in this short note in, in NIGEM, which shows that no matter when we looked at the data, which exposure metrics that we used as we got to more and more refined exposure surfaces, we're still getting very consistent estimates of the risk of mortality due to all causes, lung cancer, cardiovascular disease. So we're, 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 this approach showed really consistent estimates across different spatial modeling uh, techniques and, and different data sets that we used in our analysis over the years. Well, we actually uh, tried this with the ACS cohort with with radon, we took county level measurements of radon from the US Environmental Protection Agency and married that with the ACS cohort where we had the individual data. And this paper shows that we were actually able to identify a, the same signal. Uh, this is the Turner paper in the bottom here, a 15% increase in, in um, uh, relative risk uh, shown in that study, which is very consistent with the pooled North American data a similar pooling in, in Europe done by Sarah Darby with over 20 case control studies, 
Uh, so you're seeing, and with the underground miners that were analyzed in, in, in Bear 6 as well. So you're seeing a, a consistency across diverse sources, some of which had only ecologic measures of radon exposure, as in the, uh, the study by uh, uh, Michelle Turner shown here. I also show two studies which were able to adjust in some way for exposure measurement error. I showed you the, the North American cooling where the risk went up with adjustment for exposure measurement error. And a similar thing happened in the European uh, pooling and the adjusted risk estimates are very compatible between those two uh, data sets. Uh, time check, uh, Rania, how am I doing for time? I think you have another two minutes because you started a bit later. That would complete your 20. Okay, so I'll be really quick here. Uh, extrapolation of the minor data, which we did in Gear 6 down to residential exposure levels shows very good compatibility. Uh, and I'm actually right at my last two slides, so my timing is not too bad. Uh, the first point I want to make is evidence integration is a big theme now in uh, risk assessment. You want to integrate uh, evidence from multiple evidence streams and also from multiple data sets within those evidence streams to come up with the best possible overall estimate of risk. This is emphasized in a paper we have in Press and Haltex, and it was also emphasized in the 2014 NRC review of the US EPA IRIS process. My last point before I give you my bottom line on some suggestions for your consideration is some recent work that we've just completed on a framework for value of information. One paper is out in risk analysis. We have another one that's under review. And these two papers combined give you a very uh, detailed uh, framework for looking at if I were to go out and collect this additional data, how much additional information would it buy me with respect to achieving my risk assessment objectives? And this might be a useful way to approach what collecting data under a proposed low-dose radiation research uh, program might actually contribute to uh, reducing the uncertainties and radiation risk estimates. My final slide is uh, four, four takeaways. Uh, from my perspective, epidemiology continues to be a very important source of information for low-dose radiation risk assessment. We live in a world of big data where both radiation dose registers and uh, big databases of electronic medical records can be exploited to our advantage. The, the new fundamental uh, uh, advances in, in, uh, in biology and toxicology have led to these uh, a wide array of new approach methodologies. Uh, the Anderson paper I cited at the outset is a nice place to, to learn about those. And my final point is evidence integration across multiple evidence streams and data pooling within and across evidence streams can really lead to some uh, informative conclusions that you might not get by looking at individual data sets. And with that, I'm, I'm finished, Ryan. Daniel, thank you very much. That was uh, really helpful. We appreciate it. Uh, we'll come back to the uh, Q&As uh, at, at the end of the presentation. But uh, uh, with that, let's move on to uh, John Samet. John, thanks for joining us. We appreciate your taking the time. Okay, and uh, thanks everybody. And uh, actually looking at uh, who is in the audience, I see no need to give the talk since most of you have <laughs> lived through much of what I'm about to say, um, but uh, here, um, here goes. And uh, so I'm gonna talk a bit about um, air pollution and, um, and radon. And uh, Dan and I and Francesca have been partners in a lot of work um, on these uh, topics. So. This is the starting point, and I, I really think this is critical in thinking about research, is to define what the question actually is. And, you know, having lived through these questions and sort of seen the science policy interface, I think it's really important from the outset to say, well, what is the question that's going to be addressed? Because it's critical for design, it's critical for thinking about sample size needs, the consequences of measurement error, and uh, more. So here's some basic uh, questions that are familiar to all. I think uh, Dan already got at this question of shape when he talked about um, hormesis, uh, of course, you know, how low are risks documented? Um, is there a hazard to quote low uh, dose levels and so on? So I think up front, it's important to define what the actual uh, question uh, is. And I think the that, that I'm gonna emphasize throughout this question of low dose uh, often relates to some inherent policy uh, decision. And uh, that begins to shape 
what does the science need to address the policy question? And what is the related degree of certainty that's needed? This is from a book from Robert Proctor from uh, long uh, ago that I still like that sort of gets at this question of the policy implications of different forms of uh, dose response relationships, particularly as we go to lower and lower levels that may have very different um, implications. And for example, uh, the Clean Air Act as originally written around the criteria pollutants reads as though there was an expectation that in fact thresholds might be found that would be quite convenient for setting levels for the national ambient um, air quality uh, standards. So these different curves uh, have very different um, implications. <clears throat> so very often our studies may be directed at addressing really two, two things. What is the shape of the curve? And what is the relationship between uh, dose or concentration or exposure and risk uh, at some levels of uh, policy, uh, policy interest uh, shown here? Now, also for impact analysis, this becomes uh, very important if we're calculating the potential benefits of, um, of, uh, of a lowering of exposures or dose, then what curves are used uh, has important uh, implications. So with that, let me turn to the uh, example of uh, air pollution. First, here's the policy mandate um, for the criteria pollutants at least, that is posed by the Clean Air Act with a heavy burden placed on the uh, administrator of EPA to set a standard, the primary ambient air quality standards, the attainment and maintenance of which in the judgment of the administrator based on such criteria, criteria means evidence, and allowing an adequate margin of safety, there's that policy message, is requisite to protect the public health. And here's uh, Carol Browner in Time Magazine uh, when uh, she promulgated the 1997 PM 2.5 standard, the fine particle standard that was science-based, but controversial. And again, came with uh, very important uh, policy uh, implications. So over time, in fact, driven by science, the level of our standards has dropped substantially. The indicators have changed from total suspended particulates down to far more refined measure, PM uh, 2.5. Uh, Five. And again, in thinking about looking at the impact of these changes, what curve we think we're on makes uh, an important difference. It also makes an important difference in thinking about, say, if there were a further reduction of this is the annual PM National Ambient Air Quality Standard, what the benefits would be uh, clearly depend on which curve um, might be the uh, appropriate one. Now, here is uh, the London fog of 1952. Probably you're well aware of this wake up call event that happened that killed thousands and thousands of people. And you can see the um, death, uh, number of deaths, the levels of sulfur oxide and smoke, you can turn that into particles in your mind, you know, a hundredfold higher than what we might see in the, uh, in the US. You don't need any sophisticated analysis to decide that there's probably a relationship between air pollution and deaths. And there are, in fact, 10,000 excess deaths, roughly. That's the number still debated. There's 47 data points on the slide. Okay. And little data can be powerful, uh, of course, especially when it's like a hammer uh, hitting public health, as in this. Um, as in this uh, case. And of course, now we're talking about billions of data points and some of the larger data sets to try and tease out these uh, signals. So the challenge here, and this goes back to work um, when I was at Hopkins with uh, Francesca Domenici, who you'll hear from next, and Scott Zeger, as we began to try and sort out the question of how did we find the daily mortality signature imprint of air pollution in the face of noise that came with the black, the annual cycling over time of death rates, which is quite substantial and the variation with temperature to pull out the smaller signal of um, particulate uh, air pollution. And this is a challenge that remains in the air pollution world that we've been 
addressing with uh, ever larger data sets and more sophisticated methods. Uh, I hate to say it, this paper was published 40, uh, 40 years ago. It was one of the early time series studies of morbidity, looking at um, air pollution in uh, Steubenville, Ohio, a very industrial city uh, and um, time series of hospitalizations and of emergency room uh, visits. The levels of uh, particles were very high at the time. These are 24-hour means. Values 24 hours up to 700, which would be unimaginable uh, these days. Hopefully high levels of sulfur dioxide. And uh, using, at the time, very methods would be very considered very primitive. Now a regression approach that I took. And the data set was handed to me after being collected in Steubenville on cards. So again, little data and uh, a signal was uh, found. Now, over time, the questions uh, became, uh, was there a mortality air pollution relationship? What was it? Uh, as the national ambient air quality standards had been lowered, had there been a, a, had that relationship remained, there was a very uh, large review published in the American Journal of Epidemiology in 1978, when particle levels were still quite high, that said the air pollution mortality relationship would never be useful again. Uh, probably one of the most uh, incorrect statements written uh, about uh, the air pollution uh, health uh, relationship. So here's our uh, team that did the so-called national um, morbidity mortality and air pollution study. Scott Zeger and, uh, uh, and Francesca, we are perched on a very hot roof of a parking garage in Baltimore when this picture was uh, taken. But what we did uh, in this, and uh, Dan was later part of putting together time series studies internationally was to say, we don't need to take just one city uh, at a time. Uh, this was uh, over 20 years ago that data, uh, data management capabilities and analytic capabilities would allow for taking essentially all the data from the larger cities, which is what we did in uh, this study so that we would have our best shot at finding the, uh, finding the signal. The, uh, this is from one of the important uh, papers published from that study. This is the uh, Bayesian pooled estimates of the effect of particulate matter on daily mortality with adjustment for different pollutants, essentially showing that the PM effect was robust to consideration of uh, other pollutants. And as I recall, data here perhaps pooled from about 17 million uh, individuals, which seemed like a lot at the time, but I know in the next presentation, you'll hear about much larger studies. But as, uh, as the levels have dropped, fortunately, we have used larger and larger studies to look for signals. With this approach, we were able to look for heterogeneity across the country. This slide showing the uh, estimates for different cities and regions. The uh, question of uh, what uh, may be happening at lower and lower uh, levels of exposure has become important as the distribution of uh, exposure has shifted downwards in some countries, but not all, as you can see here. The Health Effects Institute has been uh, funding a series of studies, so-called low-level studies, that have brought together very large um, population-based administrative data sets like Medicare, various European data sets, and in Canada, various um, uh, census-based uh, studies. I think Im importantly, you can see that these span a level of particulate matter, PM 2.5, that is uh, quite, uh, quite low. And these studies, again, are continuing to show significant associations at these uh, lower levels. This kind of information drove the uh, recently uh, released WHO air quality guidelines, which for a number of pollutants like PM 2.5 were, uh, were reduced from the values within the 2005 guidelines. And this was based on 
uh, extensive uh, reviews, syntheses, and meta-analyses, and looking at where the um, where the uh, effects were seen uh, statistically significant in the uh, various uh, studies. And we certainly continue to do a lot of work on air pollution using epidemiological approaches. This is a simple crude PubMed search of uh, papers uh, on particulate matter and mortality. So there's lots to pull out there. And uh, these studies are being done now around, uh, around the world, providing a better picture. So again, uh, there's an opportunity in air pollution to put multiple data sets uh, together as done here, for example, in support of the WHO, uh, I'm sorry, this is the EPA slide. This is EPA data from the uh, 2018 Integrated Science Assessment, a uh, very similar effort done to support the WHO air quality guidelines. And, and again, with the finding of generally significant associations in some very large studies at what would now be considered uh, low, but our contemporary levels of uh, exposure. So lessons uh, from going low, I will say low is ever lower. Uh, the demand for certainty has increased. Uh, and that again relates back to the policy implications. There's work on uh, subgroups uh, of uh, interest, of course, looking at those who are most susceptible and vulnerable. And how did the research go lower? bigger study populations, many more studies, uh, pooling of different sorts and uh, enhanced uh, analytical methods. And I think a willingness of the research community to participate in these pooling uh, exercises. Just gonna move on and say a few words about radon because I think it's a useful contrast and Dan already uh, uh, alluded to some of the issues. Here, in particular, the major policy question has been, what are the uh, risks of indoor radon and what guideline concentrations should be used for mitigation? This is the home of Stanley Watrous, identified uh, in the mid 80s. Uh, it had radon levels as high as those in underground uh, uranium mines. And the question uh, became then, what were the risks for occupants of homes in general, since we quickly learned, not surprising that radon was present uh, in, uh, in homes in general. So the policy question was how much should we worry about uh, radon? And at the time, and certainly into the 90s, this topic was uh, very controversial. Uh, in part, the challenge was that in looking at the distribution, it was log normal so that some people were at very high risk out in the tail of the distribution, but population exposure in general was being driven by the uh, lower end. So there was a need for some certainty about risks. Um, for radon, like the London fog, there were these, there were dramatic events. This is a paper I published in 1984, essentially showing that in the Navajo uranium miners uh, who were, largely non-smokers, uh, the lung cancer was essentially all caused by uh, work in uranium uh, mines. And this is a picture just showing the distribution of our cases who were clustered around the sites where there had historically been underground uh, mining. The uh, relative risk here was uh, infinite. Um, just a comment about how these risks have been looked at uh, the biological effects of ionizing radiation reports, uh, Dan alluded to beer six, have addressed this. Um, beer four, published in 1988, uh, I led the, so the radon working group within the beer four committee. And we developed uh, with particularly expertise from Don Pearson, Jay Lubin, age and time dependent risk models that use data for beer four from uh, four different uh, studies. Uh, the next step was the pooling effort of the studies of underground miners exposed to radon. This is our pooling uh, group. And this led to a monograph published by the National Cancer Institute. And then uh, the beer six effort 
where Dan and his uh, colleagues had a lead role in doing much of the modeling. Beer 6, I think importantly adopted a linear no threshold model on a strong mechanistic uh, basis. And again, here, I'll just emphasize the importance of integration of mechanisms and thinking about them at the lower doses. I mean, I think in the case of radon, the energy that an alpha particle uh, imparts to the respiratory epithelium is a property of nature. It's a decay, it's a radioactive decay, and it's not dependent on what the inhaled concentration may be. So there was a strong uh, synergy, if you will, or tie in between what we reviewed mechanistically and the uh, modeling. Uh, and again, you saw something like this restricting the analysis to the lowest levels of uh, exposure in the minors. Uh, we found this um, relationship roughly linear, extending down the low doses. Some picked out this point and said, aha, hormesis, but as you can see, there's wide confidence intervals. Uh, the next step in this story uh, is led by David Richardson, a committee member of the Pooled Underground uh, Miners Analysis Project that is uh, underway and that now gives uh, a, another more powerful look, particularly with the um, addition of the German cohort to uh, the studies. These are all uranium miners and don't include uh, the others. I'll make one other note. Um, when we did beer four, uh, the indoor radon studies were just emerging. And we realized uh, Jay Lubin, Clay, Claire Weinberg, and I wrote a paper saying essentially that none of the individual studies had enough power and that pooling would be needed. And DOE actually supported a set of workshops to bring the investigators together so the data sets could be harmonized and support, we hoped ultimately a global pooling, but the North American pooling that Dan mentioned and the European pooling led by Sarah Darby. So last thoughts, um, low dose is a loaded term, if you will, and it's one that is used when there are often substantial policy implications of the finding. Intense scrutiny is likely for the findings related to risks at low doses and uh, issues of uncertainty, measurement error and its consequences, residual confounding for epidemiological studies often become critical and often highlighted by those who are, uh, in, are critical. I, I think mechanistic understanding is important around plausibility. And I think useful counters are radon where essentially there's a single agent, uh, alpha decays uh, and air pollution where there are a complex mix of uh, pollutants breathed in. PM 2.5 itself is a very complicated and highly uh, varying heterogeneous um, entity. And so people talk about mechanisms, inflammation and more, but with radon, the, the mechanistic basis is far simpler and it's, I think, far easier to support a particular form of the uh, dose response curve uh, at lower uh, doses. So with that, um, I will end. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, very helpful. Uh, as always, we appreciate it. And we'll come back with uh, questions in a bit. Uh, uh, let's move on to Francesca at this point for the third of our presentations, and then we'll have some uh, uh, Q&A. Francesca, thanks for joining us. Sorry, but by, by this time, I think I should know how to use Zoom, but still, right? Okay, so thank you again for the opportunity. Um, and I think, you know, John and Dan give you the perfect background, actually, what I'm gonna uh, take. So my, what, what I'm gonna talk, my, um, my point of view would be a little bit more into the data science and statistical issues of estimating uh, exposure response function, and um, especially when the focus is into the low dose. So these are really the questions that I wanted to try to address in my 23 minutes that were um, provided 
to me. Uh, and so really, really focusing with respect to the challenge of the opportunity of the methodological approach, and especially in this new era of data science. So, so these were really the questions that, that you guys, the committee provided to me. So, um, so I want to start, which I generally don't, but this time I'm going to start with an equation and I'm going to walk you through about what are some of the key challenges when we are trying to estimate an exposure response function in any field, whether it is radon, radiation, air pollution, anything that you can think about, right? And so most of the most, yeah, I would say the traditional statistical approaches for estimating an exposure response function basically assume that you have a function f of an exposure, let's say x, and you know we model that either linearly, if we assume that, as John said, that the only interest that we have is whether or not there is a risk, or non-linearly, right? If we want to see whether or not there is, a, there is a threshold or whether we want to see the shape. And then we add the several terms, linearly or non-linearly, to adjust for confounding, right? Where zeta could be the confounder. And I will say that that is what probably, you know, there are probably thousands of a different formulation of this equation, but I would say that that is, you know, kind of the traditional way of an estimating exposure response function. And so I wanted to point out some really very important challenges that actually we're just starting to address in the literature. And these are really important challenges because if we get any of these four points wrong, our estimates of whether or not there is an effect on low dose will be wrong. So first of all, the confounding adjustment that we assume in many of our analysis might not be additive. And there are many examples where the, the, this element of the exposure response function, this part might be just wrong. Our model could be wrong. Uh, we might specify F by our exposure response function in a way that we might not be able to detect the threshold because we assume that is smooth, which is what is done in most of the analysis. There could be different confounders at the high level of exposure and a low level of exposure. And this is actually something that we have seen in, in air pollution data. And I will guess that that's something that you might be seeing most of the situation. So when you're trying to estimate whether or not there is a risk of low dose, it's possible that the confounding, the type of confounder might be different when you're looking at the estimation at the high dose. And then this is something that Dan has been mentioning, and you know this is something we're a little bit more familiar, that could be error in the exposure and the confounders, although it's not completely clear still how we account for that. So I wanted to just open for a moment and just you know, introduce you to the concept of causal inference uh, without, of course, I'm not gonna give you, you know, a, a, a tutorial on causal inference in the next 16 minutes, but I just wanna point it out, there was a commentary that I wrote with Corey Ziegler where we really talked about caus causality it's basically what's what's causality, okay? So it's really a better way for estimating the relationship between a change in exposure and outcome that is less sensitive to model assumption. And so let me give you really a very simple example in the context of a cartoon, right? So we have actually, let's consider for a moment the six city study, right? You have Stuenville, Ohio, which has a high level of exposure and Portage, which is a low level of exposure. And so when you're trying to compare these two, these two cities, these two cities are different, right? So Stu and Bill hypothetically have a larger number of people that have a low education and a larger number of people that are smoking that portage, right? So this is this very hypothetical. So what we do is when we want to adjust for confounding, we just add into the model a linear term for education and we add into the model a linear term for smoking. But if these two confounding adjustments, as often it is, are not linear, our estimates will be wrong. And so the causal inference open the door that instead of adjusting for confounding linearly, we can do matching. And how does it work? Well, it's very simple, especially if you have a ton of data. So for example, let's say that you take Jane. Jane lives in Swimbilly, Ohio. Jane has a low education and she's not a smoker. We look, we uh, have the ability to 
measure the life expectancy of Jane. And so what we need to do is we need to estimate what the life expectancy of Jane would have been if Jane would have lived in Portage. And how you do that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. You go to Portage and you find all of the twin sisters of Jane. You find all of the women that have the same age as Jane. They are also low education as Jane and they're not smoker on Jane. They, you estimate the life expectancy and that is what we call the counterfactual. So technically and, and uh, uh, conceptually, it's not that difficult, but by doing exact matching, we have the opportunity to estimate an exposure response function and to adjust for confounding that it's not relying to model assumption. And that can make a huge difference, like giving the right answer or the wrong answer. So the issue of matching the causal inference in the context of continuous exposure now is becoming almost like mainstream. And by the way, there is a National Academy of Science Committee, which I'm part of, which is also assessing causality from a multidisciplinary evidence base for setting the national ambient air quality standards. So the field of causal inference has been around now for 40 years. And I think with the richness of data and expertise is probably, again, it's not the perfect, the perfect world, but it will allow us to not rely anymore on very strict model assumption as we did before. We have done that and we have used causal inference methodology for estimating the exposure response function. In our core studies for the Medicare participant, we have 67 million uh, people followed from 2000 to 2016. We have daily and one kilometer to one kilometer grid estimates of exposure to PM 2.5. And we um, actually, in this paper, if you're interested in digging into it, we uh, estimate the causal exposure response function between fine particulate matter and mortality in a totally non parametric way using matching. So it will be very, you know, not less, not sensitive to model assumption. And by the way, there is also uh, the code and the statistical package that is fully, um, fully available. So I'm not going to have much time to go on the de detail of the studies basically is a, it's a big extension of what you know was the national mortality morbidity air pollution study because we follow individuals for all the continental united states for 16 years and um, we consider several potential confounding and so going back to the equation that i show you instead of adjusting for confounding by adding these terms into linear model we do exact matching and we do exact matching using the generalized propensity score one thing is really important about a causal inference methodology and i want to spend a little bit of time on this plot is that you can actually visually assess whether or not you have properly adjusted for confounding. And so what this plot in, in, in the left shows, shows so the red dots are the absolute correlation between your continuous exposure, PM 2.5 or radiation, it could be, and each of the potential confounder, right? So if the correlation is ab above 0 0.1, it means that the exposure is correlated with the confounder, so there is confounding. So then what we do, we do this exact matching idea that I show you, and then we create a new data set where, remember, Jane is to Bill, Ohio is matched with many Janes. They are in Portage, Oregon. They're the same as Jane, except they have a different exposure. And when you look at the match data set, in this match data set, we break down the correlation between the confounders and the exposure. And so that means that you have if, you know, effectively and in non-parametric way adjusted for confounding. So these are the shape of the exposure response function that we estimate in the context of, of the Medicare and PM 2.5 study. There are two shapes because one is used with a computational, more computational efficient approach than, um, than the other. So bottom line is exact matching uh, a non-parametric estimation of exposure response function, I think has a lot of important features because it'll allow you to, especially in the context of big data, to really not re rely on strict model assumption for confounding adjustment. The other thing that I want to point out is that often one of the goal is to identify a threshold or identify a change point. And there are now new data science approaches. We have a paper that we're going to publish soon 
that allow you to, um, from an inferential standpoint, to, to really identify the change point and quantify how much uncertainty do you have when there is a change point. And let me give you an example. This is a, just a toy example. This is simulated data where the true exposure response function is the blue curve, right? So we have some hypothetical and the true change point in the exposure response function. And so we have developed a new methodology that then will be able to estimate the exposure response function and the confidence interval. But what is important is that we can calculate the derivative of the exposure response function, which is at this panel here, and the uncertainty around the derivative. So when the uncertainty around the, the derivative does not cover zero, it means that there are change points. So there is actually, it's interesting that often, and for 40 years, we're talking about change point or threshold the, the, the detection. Only recently, we are really at the point where we can quantify where and how much evidence we have on the, on the threshold. And so we have done that, actually, we haven't published this. This is really literally work we are doing now for the Medicare study where we have estimated this non-parametric exposure response function. We now have calculated the derivative of the exposure response function. And you see that derivative of the exposure response function and the confidence band doesn't touch zero around 12 microgram per cubic meter and 14 microgram per cubic meter, really identifying now with uncertainty and with statistical uh, significance where there could be two change point in the exposure response function. And so that's important because instead of visually look at exposure response function and see, oh, I think there is a threshold, there is actually an inferential procedure that allow you to do that. The other thing which I'm not gonna go into deep, deep detail, but we have published this work, is that when you have this hypothetical exposure response function, remember and just keep in mind that you may have a different amount of confounding and different type of confounders when you are, in, when you are looking at the low dose versus at the high dose. And so do not assume or give for granted that you have the same mechanism of confounding bias at the different levels of exposure. We had a paper, I'll give you all of the reference, where we actually have identified this in the context of air pollution study. And so I will guess that that's a common problem in other situations. So to, to wrap up, uh, what are some data science opportunity and challenges that uh, low dose radiation research could explore and how? So I think there are a lot of opportunities in terms of non-parametric estimation of a causal exposure response function. And again, the word causal here means our ability to adjust for measure confounding bias that does not rely on strict modeling assumption, which are often incorrect. Now, I didn't have a chance to tell you, but there is a, all of this a really important field that when I say I'm gonna match Jane with her twin sister, you can match Jane with, with tip, tip women similar to Jane, except for the exposure by actually using machine learning methods and the estimate the propensity score. And again, these are being shown and there is extensive literature in the data science community that are extremely effective. And then you can assess covariate balance. You can really visually see whether or not when you're estimating the uh, causal effect of a continuous exposure, you have indeed eliminated measure confounding bias. There are still a lot of challenges. I think that the issue of how we propagate exposure error in the estimation of exposure response function, it's not straightforward. I know there is a lot of statistical literature on this, but honestly, I think again, it rely on a lot of strict assumption. And so we are doing more work on this that it's really more reflecting the real world of data science and not strict modeling assumption or strictly mathematical assumption that everyone gives, you know, um, consider it that are correct one. And again, the confounders could be different at low level versus high level of exposure. Just want to mention that uh, we have, we develop in addition to methodological innovation, 
uh, packages, um, software packages. And so when I tell you about estimating a causal exposure response function non-parametrically, uh, we actually have submitted on CRAN a, um, in, in, a, in a package that can be used, of course, for any, uh, any field and any application. So these are some of the references. I think if you wanted to get a sense of the key ideas of causal inference, um, the commentary with Cory Ziegler, I think it's a great starting point. The work with Georgia Papadogorgiou is the work where we deal with um, different confounder at different level. The work with um, both, both Georgia Papadogorgiou and, and, and um, uh, Zhao Wu were PhD student in my lab. And Zhao developed this approach for estimating non-parametrically an exposure response function. And then also with Boyuran as uh, the way of quantifying uh, evidence, statistical significant evidence of a threshold by looking at the derivative of an exposure response function. Thank you for your attention. Francesca, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. We appreciate it. Uh, I think we've come to the uh, Q&A part of the uh, session. So uh, uh, let me open the floor to my uh, committee members to uh, see if we have questions. And please raise your hand. Interesting. Well, one of the things, oh, go, go ahead, Ben, and then I'll come back to the question. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for the really, really helpful presentations. Francesca, I wanted to pick on you, perhaps not surprisingly. Um, one thing I struggle with, you know, when I hear talks about causal inference and machine learning and, you know, measurement error methodology is how do we put all of things together into one coherent approach to do the analysis that we want to do? And, is, you know, as someone who's done these things, how, how do we do it in practice? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard. Uh, so first of all, let me say that I think that we are now at the point where we can estimate non-parametrically an exposure response function that has a causal interpretation and we can quantify evidence of a threshold. I think we are there. And we have three publications from my lab that, and, and the software package as well, so that you can take the software package and apply it, right? I think how we propagate exposure error in this framework, I think that it's, it's still, it's, it's, it's complicated. I, I don't think we are there yet. So I think we will be able to overcome the issue probably in another year or two. I don't think we are yet have a framework where you take all of the challenge, exposure error, and then propagate it. But I do think that if, eventually we will get there. And I think what I want to encourage the committee is not, you know, to be like to open your eye on what's happening and not to stick with what we have been doing 20 years ago, because I do think that what we're doing now, again, it's not perfect, but I do think that we are making a ton of progress. Machine learning, it's extremely effective when you want to do matching, because if you want to find another person that is identical to Jane somewhere else, and you want to match with respect to all of the characteristics, you can take machine learning to estimate the score that will make them as similar as possible and match on that score. And that can be also extremely, extremely effective. So it, you know, it's, it's not the solution for everything, but I do think that we're making a ton of progress. I think the exposure error though, it's not completely integrated into the framework. Yep, thanks, thanks. Dan, do you wanna comment on that? Just, just very briefly, I had some slides that I took out of my presentation because they were based on some work on non-ionizing radiation, but I will send uh, Rania a paper we have in the American Journal of Epidemiology a few years ago on multiple bias modeling in, in epidemiological studies where we can adjust simultaneously for systematic and random errors if you have some way of calibrating those. That might speak partially to, to Ben's question. Thank you. Simon, question? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think this is mainly directed at John and Dan. And that, forgive me, it's a bit of a naive question because I'm not an epidemiologist. Um, but it, I'm struck by the importance that time series and geographical studies seem to have had in the air pollution field in particular. Um, and I just wonder whether you thought there's any 
significant opportunities in the low dose radiation area in those sort of approaches geographical and time series um, still. Well, I'll, I'll go first and I don't know if Dan has a different opinion, but you know, I, I actually, uh, one of the famous episodes in radon was in fact an effort to have ecological studies. And uh, there's a physicist at Pittsburgh who's a name known to many, Bernie Cohen, who in, insisted that in fact, there was a negative relationship between uh, radon and uh, lung cancer based on his ecological county level analysis, which turned out to be quite confounded by smoking. And, and, and certainly in radiation, there've been other efforts to look at areas with higher natural background radiation and cancer risk. But I, I think those, are, those have not been fruitful um, exercises. And people often turn, of course, to available data, Simon, and find things that are, are probably just driven by biases. So I I think on the low dose questions, um, you know, my answer would be no. I, th I think the kinds of studies that Francesca is talking about and some of the methods of exposure estimation were sort of at, at one point sort of more had some ecological or population level and individual level characteristics. But as things have been refined, I think we've been able to do a better and better job of uh, geographically pinpointing the exposure um, estimates. So, you know, that, that, that area has changed, but Dan, please uh, comment. The Bernie Cohen story was quite a powerful one for a long time in radon. So I'll make uh, two and a half points, uh, Simon, in response to your question. Uh, first, I, I'm going to suggest that there are bigger opportunities for you guys, uh, which are based on uh, large data sets. We have access to big data like we've never had before, electronic health records, individualized lifetime radiation exposure uh, uh, metrics from uh, various dose registries. Those give terrific data and, and medical exposures. Those give us terrific data at the individual level with individual confounders. So if I'm doing uh, low dose radiation uh, risk research, I'm probably looking there first. I think we've had some great advances with spatial and temporal methods in the air pollution area, but I don't see huge payoffs in trying to exploit those uh, further. My, my half point was I wanted to have a little bit of fun in 30 seconds, the, the Cohen negative associations. I, I, I do have it in uh, one of my slides in my presentation. If I can put it on the screen just for 10 seconds while I'm speaking, if that, that would be okay. So the, the, the Cohen hypothesis was county level radon showing a decrease in lung cancer risk. And uh, he offered a, you remember John, a $5,000 prize for anybody who could show right. why he was wrong. We actually won that prize, but didn't collect in our 2011 paper because we were able to adjust county level radon in Michelle Turner's 2011 paper for individual tobacco smoking and completely eradicated this confounding Unfortunately, Jerry Puskin won the prize, uh, I think a year earlier with a similar argument, but not based on the same powerful data. So I'm, I'm crying on your shoulder that I didn't have a chance uh, to, to, to collect the, the Cohen prize for showing why he was misleading. Thank you very much. I'm very glad they asked the question now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Rashid. Yes, hi. Well, it is good to see three, three old friends. Uh, some of them going back to the 80s in case of John Samet. Uh, but I have a comment and then a question. The comment is that Francesca has given, a, for me at least, one of the most understandable talks uh, to me. But I, I just want to un highlight that the computational complexity of doing some of these analysis is quite, quite, quite formidable. And uh, one of the things that the committee has been discussing is what kind of infrastructure might be needed for, uh, for research on low-dose radiation. And we have not talked too much about computational issues, but, uh, but uh, although Francesca, I think, has, now has uh, simpler programs and algorithms for doing these, but, uh, but uh, that's something to keep in mind. My question actually is, uh, is uh, not as well, not a scientific science question, but uh, to the three of you who are very really experienced in doing air pollution research and many other areas of research, um, 
one of the tasks that the committee has given is how to organize research on low dose radiation. And you all know the DOE story, uh, it's long uh, period of, uh, of struggle with communities and even with scientists, uh, issues of mistrust and what have you. So how do we, do you have any insights on how a research program along those, uh, on low dose radi radiation may be organized that can be as effective in furthering the field of low dose radiation as air pollution has gone? Maybe this is too big a question, but just... I'll make one comment, and that is that I think one success I'll point to is the committee that I chaired on uh, research priorities for airborne particulate matter, which you know well and went on from '98 to 2004. And I think what that committee did that proved useful was to highlight exactly what the uncertainties were that the uh, research agenda needed to address. And it, it, it offered a framework that sort of the research could be hung on and the funding needs could be hung on. So I, it actually, and, and I think in practice, it proved useful to EPA and the scientific community, or generally, Rashid, as you know, and to HEI. So that, that's the one comment I will offer that I think in that instance, um, it proved that that kind of framework proved successful. And it went beyond sort of listing you know, priorities and saying, here's the top 10 or whatever, so. Thank you. Dan? I'll, I'll just offer one as well. And it's it's kind of organizational and it's kind of, it's kind of scientific at the same time, uh, Rashid. We've had great successes, as you've heard, in data pooling, you know, the pooling of the residential radio and case control studies, the pooling of the underground minor cohorts, uh, the, uh, the, the pooling indeed of cohort studies internationally uh, on air pollution. And those pooling exercises have all offered tremendous insight, but you may not realize it, but those are difficult things to do. You have to get people to work together. You have to coordinate multiple institutions, multiple countries. You know this because you've been successful at this uh, at HEI, uh, Rashid. So getting people together to kind of form a consortium and contribute data to, to address a common research objective would be my one point that I would offer in response to your question. Thank you, Francesca. Yeah, I just want to quickly respond to Rashid about the computational infrastructure. I think that this is why it's so important uh, for us to have the opportunity and, and in some way also thanks to the HEI to hire a software engineer. So then when I say we have a package, it means that everyone that has access to you know, good computational capability that every academic center should have can now run these analysis, not because we developed the methodology, but because we had the ability to hire software engineer to work with us and develop the software package. So in the same way, you use a SAS macro to run an old, linear regression model, now you run another macro that can allow you to do that. It is more computational expensive, but not something that any academic center has, you know, has the capacity. Thank you. Lindsay, question? Yeah, so one of our um, tasks is to talk about some of the research gaps, and I, I feel like they're really nice parallels. I really appreciate all of your talks between radiation and, and air pollution. And we wonder about the idea that you, know, you get to a certain point where the potential health impacts from a given dose, when that dose is relatively low, those health impacts are perhaps quite small, part particularly in comparison to the potential for confounding effect modification dose error. And so I'm wondering if you can just reflect on, on your intuition about the data as you try and move down to those lower exposure ranges and the relative magnitude of the health impacts of, of the dose itself, as opposed to potential confounders or effect modifiers. So, you know, I think this is a great question. And I think, Lindsay, that's why it's important to, number one, have access to as much as data as you can possibly have, and to have potentially a lot of information on the low dose, right? Because if you have a lot of information on a lot of people that are exposed at low dose, then now you, we have, I think, the capacity and then analytical tool to disentangle the confounder from the exposure 
a low dose. So we don't know that, right? Actually in our pollution research with the PM 2.5, with the three projects, there's been one project in the US at so MPI and one project in Canada and one project um, in Europe, all three of us in the context of exposure response relationship are finding a steeper slope, a low level than a high level. So um, I don't know what are the research gaps in the context of low dose radiation, but it seems that that is one. And I think that's something that should be addressed, but it's not that it's impossible to address, especially if you have data. Thank you. Uh, John, question? No, you're muted, John. Those are great presentations, so very stimulating. Um, I had two questions for the group. One is, there's this continued measurement of effects of PM 2.5, even though everybody knows that PM 2.5 is this complicated uh, mixture. Uh, I forget how it was described by one of you. You've got sulfates, you've got nitrates, you've got direct carbon containing particles. And from the policy point of view, these things come from different sources. So you, you would, would really like to have these risk estimates from the different sources. What's not clear to me is why can't you use the same tools you've been talking about to develop the component specific effect estimates rather than continually studying PM 2.5 as a combination. So that's the first question. And the second question, which is, is ties this more to our committee's charge is, you know, we're struggling with how to bring the radiation biology information together with epidemiological and statistical information. And to be quite honest with you, as I listened to your presentation, most of the advances you described to me just seemed like better, better epidemiology and better biostatistics. I mean, is there some contribution here from, from biological evidence to the what we're understanding with PM 2.5 and how does that get brought into the picture? Thank you. You know, I may make a few quick comments and others will want to weigh in. On the PM components, John, and, and this is one of the strengths of the, the research framework in the 1998 uh, committee, we highlighted that as a, uh, an important point and suggested approaches to it. Part of the problem there has been there are so many degrees of freedom that it's hard to sort um, out, but efforts have been made. And there have been analyses that have been source directed now on risks. So that um, has been done using sort of source apportionment approaches for the, um, the, the PM. So that approach has been taken. You know, on the, uh, I mean, I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, we've long argued that someday um, that there would be this sort of wonderful world in which we're developing probably Bayesian models that fold in underlying mechanistic uh, considerations and epidemiology. And to an extent, I mean, some of that's been done in a multi-stage modeling approach example, you know, building biology, biologically based frameworks as Dan, um, alluded to, but, um, you know, I think your point is well taken, uh, but we may need stronger mechanistic grounding. You know, for example, I mean, going back to Francesca's comment, it may be, uh, well be that there are certain mechanisms that are important at very high levels of exposure that play in differently to lower levels of exposure for some agents. So it's, it's hard. I mean, I, I think radon is just so easy because the biological hit to the cell is we know what it is and we we know that it's not you know dose or exposure dependent uh francesca i just want to quickly add with, with to what john said of which of course i agree completely is just in terms of estimating health impact of the component and so what i felt what i i think happened there is you know, there was a lot of interest in estimating health, the health effect of the different component and a lot of studies. And to be honest with you, I think we failed because we couldn't, all the different investigators, we could never come up with an side of consistency. And I think one of the main reasons was because we didn't have good exposure on the different components. But that is changing now. And again, I think it goes back to technological advances, because I think we are making tremendous progress on estimating exposure to PM by exposure to the component. 
through the use of satellite data, through the use of um, atmospheric chemistry model, and through the use of machine learning. And so I think that hopefully, um, in the next two to five years, we will see, I think, much more solid evidence of the impact of the components because we have better data and better, better tool than what we had just five or 10 years ago. Uh, Dan, then we're gonna have two quick questions and then we're gonna be out of time. Um, so good, good, good comments, uh, uh, John. The, on the biology, I wanted to point to the key characteristics of human carcinogens, which are summarized in that IR volume and some of our own papers, which I can send to, to Rania. But those are uh, 10 key characteristics based on 27 toxicological endpoints. You could look at those. We've actually tabulated for all the radiation carcinogens identified by IR, which key characteristics are expressed. And that gives you some information on biological mechanism, which can be tremendously important in deciding uh, what you would expect the shape of the dose response curve to be, not only at low doses, but as you may have dose dependent transitions as you go up the dose response curve due to things like saturation effects. So the biology I think is, is very important, but the counterpoint to that is, uh, well, my second comment was to reinforce Source apportionment studies on air pollution. George Thurston has led a very nice uh, detailed HEI analysis, which Rashid can, can point you to, which will tell you what the most important sources and types of mixtures are that, that uh, produce the most uh, potent PM 2.5 mixtures. And But my, my hope is that with the data that we now have, big data sets that we've never had before, better exposure metrics that we've never ever had before in some of these radiation dose registers and better information on individual confounders, we might be able to say epidemiologically and statistically at uh, environmentally relevant exposure levels, make pretty, pretty good statements about what the risks are. So that's, that's my hope would be the outcome of all your deliberations, considering the different sources of information, including the basic biology. Sorry for being a little long-winded in my answer. Okay, we're, thank you. We're running a bit, we're actually out of time for this session, but these, uh, com these uh, discussions are really uh, centrally uh, important to uh, what, what it is that we're gonna be writing about. So I'm gonna let this session go on for another 10 minutes. Uh, if there are downstream speakers that have a problem with just pushing the whole program back, would you email Rania and uh, let her know about that and we'll uh, dynamically adjust the downstream schedule. But uh, let's keep going with the Q&A for a few more minutes. Uh, uh, Bernie? Yeah, superb presentations, uh, really exciting work. Uh, look, the issue that we're dealing with for a long uh, low dose radiation is mostly not an acute effect, but mostly a chronic effect. And of course, Americans move a lot. And, you know, pharmacovigilance data uh, is, is great, but it's mostly as old folks who are taking the, uh, taking the drugs. And, and what if Jane moves uh, northward because of, uh, a global climate change or whatever. I mean, are, there's obviously patterns to movement. And are, are, is that going to be a limitation for trying to do some of the things we want to do uh, in using the kind of approaches that you suggested? Or yeah, how would you get around the movement? So, I mean, I can just speak for a moment with respect to my presentation, the statistical tool that I was presenting was in the context of long-term exposure and chronic effects, not in the context of acute effect. So uh, this was all in the context of, you know, chronic exposure. Uh, clearly, you know, depending on which data you're looking for, whether or not you can assess long-term exposure to a contaminant uh, will depend on whether or not uh, the individual subject move. So uh, this is really depending on the quality of the study that you're looking at. In, in, in our context where we looked at the Medicare data, we actually do know whether or not someone move residents. And so we, in all our study, in the chronic air pollution study, we exclude you know, the Jane that decided to move from Connecticut to, to Florida, we can identify them and we can take them out. So it's a definitely a challenge and something you have to look at. You cannot assume that, that everyone stay in the same place, but depending on the data sources, you might be able to assess whether or not they move. And so you either assess the long-term exposure based on where they moved or you exclude the movers from, from your analysis. 
Thank you. Uh, Gail? Yeah, I mean, when you talked about a lot of the, all of you, I'm not sure who would be best to answer this. It seems like the major focus was still on cancer, but there are other health effects from radon and there are other health effects from uh, air pollution. How do you calculate that in risk models and how do you look at those differences? Um, so I can no. just, okay, Ben, do you want to go? Go ahead. Oh, you go ahead, Francesca. So I think from my own perspective, all of the um, consideration I made, it's applicable for any type of health outcome. And in the context of air pollution research, we, you know, there have been studies from, you know, from all cause mortality to neurological disease, to cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease. So it's not you know, limited to one outcome and another outcome. And there is also additional research which I have not been able to, you know, I've not had the time to talk about, but I think it could be relevant, is also to assess the um, effect of a continuous exposure on several multiple outcomes simultaneously. And I think that's also something that if the committee want is interested, I can definitely provide some of, some of, um, some of the references, but there was not any, focus on a specific outcome from, from, you know, from, from my own consideration. I guess what I'm thinking about is that the dose response curves and those things are likely to be different for different outcomes. And we're certainly interested in non-cancer outcomes as well as others. So I, I'd at least like to see that paper. That'd be great. Thank you. So I want to ask a question. I, I'm going <laughs> to pick on uh, John and Dan for a minute here. So both of you in the radon study linearly extrapolated across a low dose point, uh, which was lower than your uh, uh, linear extrapolation curve. Uh, and John, I think you justified that on the ground, on mechanistic grounds that uh, radon induces damage. We know how that happens. And, and so uh, that's a reasonable assumption, but, but there is, an emerging body of data that says that in, not necessarily in that circumstance, but in some circumstances, exposure to radiation actually stimulates the immune system uh, to have a long-term efficacy against uh, uh, radiation-induced damaged cells. And uh, if, if that were the case, uh, then in fact, there might be an argument uh, for there being some non-linear effect there. And so I guess what I'm trying to get to is uh, when, when one of the things we're thinking about is that there's a lot of biology uh, that's uh, coming to the fore now that has to do with immune responses, that has to do with the, uh, the uh, Im impact of uh, stress in the brain, et cetera, et cetera, on uh, the immune system, on uh, damage repair processes and so on that aren't necessarily linearly related uh, to dose. So how, how do you think about uh, considering that uh, as we develop the next generation epidemiological models? Sure, so now I'm, I'm gonna talk about things I know absolutely nothing about, uh, but I will say that on beer six, there were people who were, and I, you know, I, I actually think, um, Joe, that the sort of the high LET radon example is not a good one really for your context of what you're talking about. And I, you know, understand right. you know, certainly the issues you raised. So, you know, and, and that again speaks to some of the elegance of the work even available back in the 90s, the single cell radiation experiments, you know, that Eric Hall and others were doing, I think were pretty directly informative. I mean, there were bystander cell effects in these systems that they used, but I mean, the, you know, I think the alpha particle example is a little bit different, I think, from the sort of more general radiation concerns you're having, which are probably less about high LET. Yeah, well, to, to take a general argument here. How, yeah. how do we dial in the biology? Sure. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, I, I think, and, and I you know, think I believe the rest of this answer to Francesca and uh, Dan, but I, I think it would be willing, uh, it be potentially to say, well, look, here's our prior idea of what the dose response curve might look like across this range of doses versus that range of doses based on the considerations that you have and in the kinds of Bayesian models that might be used to structure into it what the prior is. And now having said even more about things I know nothing about, i leave it to Francesca and Dan to comment. But I think that would be the general approach is to build in biologically based priors into the models. Cool, okay, excellent. 
Uh, Francesca, Dan, either of you want to elaborate further? No, I mean, I think I think John John is 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 right. I just say that because he's here. But anyway, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> <laughs> no, I completely agree. I think it's hard, but I do think that we have now the scientific understanding and the technology it would be really exciting to start within a biologically based shape of exposure response function and then see the degree to which the data that we have that even if it's a lot of data is often imperfect to see the degree to which is consistent with our biological hypothesis. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dan, quick answer and then uh, Ben, last question. I, I like the way you frame the question, how do we dial in the biology? If you go back to my slide on evidence integration, there was human, animal, and mechanistic read biologic evidence. I think it's a critically important uh, part of the, the, uh, the evidence lines that you want to consider. How would I do it? If you looked in beer seven, there was a long discussion of the different biological mechanisms by which different types of radiation at different doses, at different routes of exposure might act, and that uh, discussion of biology was a big deal in, in that group. Ultimately, I would end up trying to see, do I understand the biological mechanisms, number one, number two, what would those mechanisms imply for a dose response function, and number three, if I had sufficient data to test whether or not I could uh, validate that mechanism in, under real world conditions would be the icing on the cake. So that's my short answer. I could talk a lot about this, but you asked for a short response. Great, that's very helpful. I'll go look at beer seven. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, and my question is a yes or no uh, for for Francesca. So I love that we're getting into the weeds because that's where biostatisticians live most of their lives. So, you know, you you're estimating the the dose response function non parametrically based on you know biological knowledge. Would you ever think about restricting, you know, putting any restrictions or constraints on that dose response function based on your biological knowledge. You're muted. <laughs> muted. Yes. yes or no? <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> but but you, you will have to face a criticism of people that don't agree with you on the biological hypothesis and say that you're not going to listen completely to the data. Yeah, yeah. So yes, with the caveat. Yeah, thanks. All right. Well, thank you, uh, all three of you. This has been a, an incredibly helpful uh, session. Uh, I think it really advanced our thinking a lot on this, and uh, we'll um, have to go back and read the uh, tons of literature that you've brought to our attention. So again, thanks for taking the time to join us. And uh, at this point, we need to move on to the, uh, the next session, uh, which is really going to uh, continue uh, the uh, discussion of risk evaluation uh, uh, in this context uh, with uh, stakeholder participation and uh, some of the lessons that have been learned in that space. And uh, now we have uh, four speakers, uh, David Cosson from Vanderbilt, I think Catherine Higley from uh, Oregon State, uh, Stephen Crown from uh, Vanderbilt and Michael Greenberg from uh, Rutgers. And so we'll have presentations from each of these four individuals and then uh, uh, have our questions at the end. And again, I apologize for letting us run about 10 minutes long, but uh, hopefully that won't perturb your schedules too much today. So with that, let me turn the floor over to David and uh, ask you for your presentation. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us. And if you bear with me one moment to get this going for us. And uh, unfortunately, Kathy is not able to join us today. Um, so I'll cover her slides for us, but we have one set of slides and I hope that they are made available to the committee. Um, but uh, the study director asked me to present on CRESP with the idea that uh, CRESP may be a potential model for this organization for the committee recommendations as to how to approach the low dose issue and build credibility there. So that's the way uh, we organize this with a couple of case studies also. I also tried to answer the very specific questions that Raina outlined to me in her email and in our discussions. So as you mentioned, co-presenters here today, again, thank you for inviting us to join you. Um, to give you a little bit of background, CREST's mission is to support the safe, effective, and publicly credible risk-informed management of existing and future nuclear waste, both from the government defense and civilian sources. And we do that through several modes. 
uh, strategic analysis, which is usually multidisciplinary, uh, including experts both as part of the CREST team and beyond the CREST team, uh, review in specific areas uh, as we're requested or as we believe is appropriate, and applied research and education. The applied research usually involves graduate students, doctoral students, and postdoctoral students. Uh, we have a web page that you can go to for more information. And over the course of CREST history, which I'll talk about a little bit, uh, we've been involved with most, if not all, of the DOE complex uh, from the defense sites, uh, the small sites, the large sites, et cetera. And throughout all of this, what we've been trying to do is improve the confidence in the environmental management decisions being made by providing external credibility, providing additional credibility, a capability through the academic resources, and trying to provide certainty and understand and communicate the uncertainties where they exist in all of these decisions. Uh, so within that, uh, CRESP is organized, if you look at the bottom, around different topical areas, uh, waste processing and special nuclear materials, the remediation issues, uh, the nuclear waste policy and strategy that they take, and stakeholder engagement and communication. We've had this organization for quite some time. And as I mentioned, we support each of those areas through strategic assessment, applied research, review, and education. And we map that into the different needs that DOE has uh, as it works through the issues that it faces. Um, CRESP is a multi-university consortium that has evolved over time. Uh, it was originally the result of a competitive uh, request for proposals, and we were the awardee back in 1995. Um, it was originally founded under the leadership of one of your committee members, uh, Dr. Bernie Goldstein, uh, with as the PI, and Charles Powers, or Chuck Powers as he's known, as the executive director, Gil Ullman, John Moore, and Art Upton, uh, as being the uh, ma original management board for CRESP. Uh, many of these folks I'm sure you recognize. And it was in response to a National Academy's recommendation uh, that we move forward. Um, when we talk about stakeholders, we're talking about not only the public and interested groups, but we're also talking about different organizations and entities that have different defined roles in the management decisions that are made. That includes the federal regulators, the Department of Energy, the state regulators, the tribes, the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board, we've got site-specific advisory boards, we've got local, state, and federal elected officials, and we've got the public and advocacy groups, both at the national level and at the local level for the major sites. So engagement becomes very complicated. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but I've got two slides here about who is CRESP. It's led by a management board, which is highly multidisciplinary. Uh, we have eight universities that are part of the regular uh, CREST core, and as necessary for specific expertise, we go out to other universities or other folks that are not aligned and bring them in for review or specific challenges that we may be asked to address. Uh, so these are a list. I'm sure you can read through that on your own, so I'm not going to spend the time now with that. But why CREST? Uh, it's an independent team. It's arm's length from the Department of Energy. We're as a cooperative agreement. We're not a contract. We're not a grant. Um, and it's multidisciplinary experts that are pulled from, uh, pulled from all over the country and international experts in nuclear and environmental law, social science and policy, uh, and then the specific technical issues that they face, landfills performance, leaching assessment, nuclear waste processing, safety, environmental health, physics, ecology, just to name a few. Um, all of us have our primary roles as academics and um, our employment and salary doesn't depend on this. Uh, basically, we're all tenured professors. Uh, most of us are at the most senior level at the universities. So it allows us to speak freely and speak our minds. Um, we highly leverage what we get from uh, EM, both with the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission activities, EPA, the Defense Board, National Academy committees that many of us serve on, GAO, we have regular interactions with, et cetera. Um, and we also have the ability to tackle sensitive issues um, and to do that kind of off the radar or to bring things to the table from different perspectives that the national labs or that DOE itself cannot do. Um, 
as I mentioned, we have wide reach back and uh, we are also very flexible. We have an annual scope of work, but we also have ad hoc requests that come and we reorganize our priorities when things come up that are uh, high priorities for DOE or for some of the other stakeholders. Um, also, since we've been in place since uh, 1995, We've been along and through, un, I've lost count of how many assistant secretaries for EM, and we have quite a long institutional memory of the issues that they faced at individual sites and at headquarters. Uh, we do offer graduate training. We have a host of doctoral students and postdoctoral uh, fellows throughout the universities involved. And also when requested, we do professional training for DOE or for professionals at other organizations uh, that is in the interest of moving this issue forward of cleanup of the uh, DOE complex. Uh, we're unique in the fact that we have multidisciplinary teams. We can bring the types of expertise such as law and policy uh, that the national labs do not do. We often work in concert with the national labs or collaborate with them, uh, but we also provide independent activities from them. Um, and depending on the nature of the problem, the engagement with stakeholders, can be very broad and uh, it's not a one size fits all. I really need to emphasize that a lot, that understanding the context and who the stakeholder groups are that are critical for a particular problem changes by location, by the nature of the problem. And you'll see some examples of that. Um, Raina sent us some specific questions about operational aspects. Uh, CRESP has been awarded in five year uh, intervals that have been renewed. We do an annual scope and budget allocation, uh, which the CRESP leadership, the management board develops in dialogue with the DOE Office of Environmental Management. Sometimes we have additional tasking from the Office of Nuclear Energy, sometimes from NNSA, sometimes from the uh, Legacy Management Office. Um, ad hoc reviews and projects are often requested during the year. Uh, they may be small issues uh, that can you take a look at uh, some risk communication pieces that they're putting together. They may be larger issues. You'll hear about a few of them today. Um, and sometimes um, they're just, can you provide some advisory uh, information to DOE or to some of the other folks, such as to um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We're asked to comment on specific proposals, sometimes informally, sometimes formally. Same thing for the GAO and for other uh, federal agencies. Uh, the results in the projects and the reviews are briefed to, to, to DOE and other interested stakeholders. Typically project reports and reviews are posted to the CRESP website from 30 to 90 days after their completion, at least to give DOE and other involved uh, folks in the studies time to respond before it's publicly posted. But we're committed to everything that we do being public. Uh, the publications and presentations don't require any prior review by DOE. That's important because they can't tell us not to say something or they disagree. Uh, we obviously seek their input, we seek their uh, responses and discuss things with them, but they don't have veto power. And that's been very important in the credibility of what we've done and in interacting with state agencies or with EPA that often can be at strong disagreement. Uh, with the agency. Uh, we provide them quarterly progress reports. Um, there's no formal process for evaluating the effectiveness and implementation of CRESP recommendations. There have been some cases where they have implemented a formal process. For example, when we were dealing with issues for the pretreatment facility at Hanford uh, Waste Treatment Plant, uh, there were some high profile issues that were raised by the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board we were asked to form a review committee of experts on some of their mixing problems. And we generated about a dozen letter reports that came out of that, that the Office of River Protection formally tracked and responded to. That was different than other cases that we've had. Uh, but again, it's, it's not always a one size fits all. Okay, uh, the current projects relating to engagement with stakeholders. So, we have projects that are focused on the engagement aspects themselves, as well as uh, the engagement and communication with stakeholders being an integral part of many of our projects, if not most of them. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the relevant stakeholders vary by project. Um, 
Often we've been requested to help DOE with stakeholder communication. And that may be by reviewing documents, by providing training to some of their senior management, uh, or it may also be uh, participating in the risk communication uh, at some of the troubled areas. And we'll give you some examples of that. Uh, right now, ones that we've been involved with in the past short time, I uh, mean, the past few months, is the restart of unfiltered ventilation at the waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico. Um, and we'll have, uh, Steve Cron will talk about that in more detail. The review of the Portsmouth environmental reports, I'll talk about that a little bit because Kathy couldn't join us. Um, risk communication of the Portsmouth detection of Neptunium 247 at a public school. And again, Kathy was gonna speak to that, but I'll speak to that for her. And then risk communication workshop for the site-specific advisory board chairs meeting. Uh, Mike Greenberg and Kathy Higley put on a very nice workshop for them for half a day and then followed on with future discussion of how to engender better communication engagement at the individual sites through the SSABs. Um, right now, the communication centric projects that we have are measuring and communicating EM objectives and accomplishments, uh, improving risk communications, a special issue of risk analysis, and the role of social media in public engagement. Uh, we've got some more details on these as supporting information, if time permits, at the end of this discussion. Um, so here's just a few notable successes over the years of CREST. Uh, Amchika, Alaska was, this is a project that Chuck Powers led with many of us involved. And also we brought on the state of the uh, University of Alaska at Fairbanks as part of the team to carry this out. Uh, at Amchika, there were three underground nuclear test shots that were carried out, including the largest one the US ever did, the Kanakin test shot. And the question raised by the state of Alaska and by the native Aleuts was, were residual radionuclides from the test shot cavities migrating through the subsurface and up into the sea, uh, through the sea floor and being taken up by the various uh, ecosystems there, which subsequently became a large fraction of commercial fishing and subsistence food supplies uh, coming out of that region, the North Pacific. Uh, for that, uh, CRESP organized a science advisory board that then came up with a science plan. Uh, that science plan was done in communication with the state, with the Aleuts, with many visits up there. Uh, then it implemented that science plan and had representatives from the Aleut uh, communities as part of actually carrying out, fielding the ships, being on it, collecting samples and the like. Uh, the analysis uh, of the samples and some other aspects was carried out at Vanderbilt. We did split samples with the national labs. And then when all was said and done, we went back, Joanna Berger uh, from Rutgers was a masterful person with all this, of meeting with the individual Alu community. She spent a couple of weeks up there uh, going from community to community and discussing the outcomes as well as presentations to the state and to other stakeholders like fish and wildlife. And then the outcome of that was the development of a biomonitoring plant, which subsequently was implemented. And even Greenpeace came out in favor of this, uh, the headline. So it was really a, quite a success uh, that we uh, were able to achieve. Uh, the Hanford Site Wide Risk Review was a different type of project that was taking a holistic view of the Hanford site and all the remediation issues that were there. Um, there, the risk communication was very much engaged with the site-specific advisory board, with the local town elected officials, as well as with DOE and with the communities. We went in there first and told them what our tasking was, what we we're gonna do and get some input on that. We held a few public meetings and met with the advisory boards. And then after that, we came up with a methodology and we put that out for public comment had additional meetings in the communities, got feedback on the methodology, altered the methodology based on that feedback, and then completed the study. The study at that point then was briefed back to the communities, um, as well as other interested parties like GAO, we briefed it to. Um, and in turn, um, this while had quite a bit of controversy from what I would say a political perspective with it, uh, the science and what our recommendations were had not been questioned uh, to, to date. And that's over the past few years. 
uh, and many of the things that we stated in there has been the basis of further actions. Uh, the cementitious barriers partnership was different in the sense that that was to look at grout and the uh, as a waste form, as well as the vaults, tanks, and other uh, cement and concrete materials that are used in the nuclear complex. And that was dealing with an issue that was between the department, some of the state agencies, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, um, and some of the plans that the department had. So we put together a group of independent experts that worked on this, and it included representation from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, that they had some of their experts on it. We had uh, representatives of the national labs. Uh, this was also briefed at public meetings, but also came out with a series of reports and recommendations uh, that set the foundation for some of the studies that are going on now, including the one that the National Academies is involved with for low activity waste alternatives at Hanford. The landfills partnership was a different type of study. It's led by Craig Benson. Um, and in turn, this was to deal with issues of near surface disposal. And here the state regulators, the state uh, association of SWAMO of state uh, environmental agencies, as well as the Nuclear Regulatory Commission have all been active stakeholders in this. First asking what are the issues that are most concerning to them then executing a research program that addressed them with their involvement. And some of the outcomes of that are reports even that are published uh, under the new reg uh, framework by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So some key lessons learned, engage with stakeholders early and often. Um, you have to do individual, small group and open public meetings. They're all important. One's not a substitute for the other. Uh, different stakeholders have different information needs. You cannot take a one size fits all and be approachable and familiar to the stakeholders. Don't just show up and then go away and don't come back. You have to have regular ongoing engagement. Uh, you've got to listen to the input and provide feedback on how you address the input and how it influenced the outcome. Uh, make the science and the facts and the uncertainties clear and uh, communicated in a manner appropriate and understandable to the intended audience. Uh, one of the cases was where people wanted to communicate to a very low income community about some of the risks and relative risks from radiation exposure. And the first suggested uh, analogy was uh, flying on an airplane, a cross continental flight on an airplane. None of these people had ever been on an airplane. Uh, so coming back to examples that were more relevant to the community was very important. And Kathy Higley was masterful at that. Um, use as that's examples and be clear about your role in the process. We're not decision makers, uh, but we provide uh, input to the process. So here are some recent case study examples. Uh, Kathy was gonna talk to this when she's been the lead on it. Um, a independent consultant uh, working for the community uh, identified that Neptunium 237 was present in the ceiling tiles of a middle school. Hey, David? Yes. You're running a bit long on this one. I'm wondering if you can expedite uh, some of these. Uh, yes, these we are. We're, we're going real quickly through it. Thank you. Uh, so they detected that that precipitated a series of sampling uh, and engagement with the communities. Crest provide insight into the radiological collection. Uh, they had a member participate in the science advisory board as well as ongoing meetings. And most recently we provide uh, a member of the Crest team to communities to meet in coffee shops and the like and answer questions. Uh, plutonium finishing plan, I'm gonna turn this over to Steve to talk about. Thanks, David. Uh, in uh, 2018, there were two uh, offsite contamination events at, uh, at Hanford that were linked to the D&D work at the plutonium finishing plant. Based on that, the Deputy Secretary of Energy formed an expert panel. Uh, first deal, we shut down the, the project and uh, the Deputy Secretary set up an expert panel to advise DOE on actions needed to safely restart the work. Uh, it's important to understand that the, the, all of the special nuclear material and high radiological material had been removed from <clears throat> this facility at the time of the effort. So they were into deconstruction of the structure that you see on this slide. Uh, next, next slide. 
uh, sorry, the first paragraphs will repeat, um, but uh, if we move on to the second bullet, uh, Crest provided two researchers, uh, one experienced in radiation protection, uh, Kathy Higley, and myself as a nuclear facilities, uh, nuclear safety expert to the panel. We assessed the Richland office uh, corrective action plan and, and, uh, and uh, root cause analysis. We reviewed the contamination patterns to determine what the root cause of the contamination issues were, and then evaluated uh, DOE's uh, restart process and their new uh, and their new work practices to reduce the uh, possibility of that in the future. Um, and uh, Cress provided specific formal comments on both the root cause analysis and the restart plan to the deputy secretary. More recently and still ongoing is a project at the waste isolation pilot plant, the uh, uh, Transuranic Waste Repository in New Mexico. Uh, they are evaluating restarting a ventilation system that is not filtered with high with HEPA filters uh, to allow them to increase airflow in the mine during uh, operations that are that do not involve moving radiological waste. Uh, it also allows them to operate more equipment, most of which is operated by diesel engines. Uh, so there is a, a uh, limitation on this operation that no waste can move during the time periods that this plan would be in operation. Um, so uh, the, the anticipated advantage advantages are as shown on the bottom of this slide. Um, next slide. So what have we, our involvement, uh, Kathy Higley and myself has been to review the nuclear safety analysis associated with potential accidents that could lead to releases uh, from the facility. We did independent analysis of both historical radiological monitoring data and put any potential re releases associated with the tests that have been ongoing of this system. Uh, and we've, provided formal feedback to DOE and the Carlsbad field office. We have also provided independent um, members to attend public meetings where the restart of this system has been uh, briefed to the public. And we uh, are ongoing with uh, review of the next stage of testing. Okay. Let's turn this over to Mike. Now, if you can talk about the study, Mike. Sure, this uh, was a very large study that took over two years to do, and it came from Congress. Congress wanted to find out how effectively the DOE was identifying its programs and executing its plans to address risk from DOE's remaining environmental cleanup liabilities. And putting that in English, what that, what that means is, were they using the money they were getting in their budget as effectively from an economic point of view and from a public health point of view as possible. And in order to do that, we knew that we were gonna to have to talk to a lot of people around the country. Everything from individual stakeholders to a lot of people in DOE, but also a lot of people in other organizations like state organizations and EPA organizations, all of who do not necessarily get along famously with each other. I think that's probably an understatement. So we interviewed over 100 people in various states on the phone. We went and visited them. This was the pre-Zoom era. Uh, and we looked at many, many documents. The result was a report. And that report was fact-checked by independent peer reviewers that CRESP retained. Uh, and we got back a lot of questions. And they were also uh, peer reviewed by the agencies whose points of view we were representing. And some of them didn't agree with what we said. So we had to talk and negotiate with them. And then these were uh, ultimately submitted to uh, Congress. So I have the next slide, Dave. So uh, we came up with 24 recommendations, not on purpose, it turns out to be 24. And uh, we found that not surprisingly, 
human health and safety is, plays a very important role in prioritization and budgeting. But it's not clear exactly how much, and that's because there's so many other factors involved. Most notably consent degrees, which DOE signed with these sites, mostly in the 1990s, to say that they were gonna accomplish a particular set of tasks by a particular way at a certain site. And they couldn't do it for technological reasons, political and other reasons. So uh, that would come back and bite DOE because someone would then go to the judge and the judge would often say, no, you have to do this and you have to do it by a certain date and then they would negotiate it. It was very important all of this to not only have uh, uh, the legal implications taken care of, but you had to have stakeholder inputs from the citizens advisory boards, the local chambers of commerce, the worker groups. Uh, the citizens advisory boards are really good. Uh, we've talked to a bunch of them over the years. The tribal nations have very strong feelings about these things and they don't hesitate to uh, voice them. And then so the DOE needed to take into account some of these recommendations they did. I think it's fair for me to say, and Steve, you were there. So if, you, if I'm terribly wrong, you can correct me. Most of the recommendations we made to the agencies, meaning EPA, DOE were accepted. Most of the ones we made to Congress were not. The Congress was uh, reluctant to make the kinds of political and what I call political and economic decisions they needed to make. So we wrote a very, very large report, which I have a feeling no one's gonna to wanna to read, but there is this short paper that we put in risk analysis or a short, uh, short time ago that you can read and that'll sort of give you the Reader's Digest version of, of that study. So Dave, do you want me to take uh, the next uh, two slides? Um, if you want to do them quickly, because I'm sure the committee's got questions and I know they're yeah. running behind schedule already. Okay, so oh. okay. Go ahead. a DOE now retired official came to us and said, you know, it would be very interesting if we could judge the extent to which the stakeholders, the community stakeholders actually understand what we are telling them about what we are accomplishing. I didn't know what we would, getting ourselves into, we found out shortly thereafter by looking at the media content of DOE state and EPA publications in on the media, uh, on the computer, uh, what they were accomplishing. And uh, the bottom line of the story, and we wrote a paper on this too, which you're certainly welcome to read, which essentially says they tend to contradict each other. That is what DOE at the site, what the states in their version of a DEP or EPA, and um, sometimes what EPA is saying, contradict each other. The goals they set forth are different. The accomplishments are expressed in different ways. If I was a stakeholder living in one of those places, I wouldn't know which information to trust. So we have put this, written this paper, and I'm hoping eventually and we would love to be able to work with the, the site-specific advisory boards to have them take the lead on figuring out how to get messaging that is not totally consistent among the levels of government, but consistent enough to where the stakeholders can read and say, ah, okay, now I understand what they're doing. So that's what that project was about. And I'm happy, obviously, to go into more detail. And finally, uh, based on, again, discussions with DOE and our own interests, uh, we've been trying to help DOE with what I'll call actionable recommendations regarding risk communications. And so we have worked out an arrangement with uh, risk analysis, which many of you know for a long time, I was editor in chief and Tony Cox was, took over from me and Tony's agreed. And next year we're going to have a special issue of risk analysis, which is going to talk about not only the role of planning risk communications, which you have to have, if you walk in and you haven't got a plan, you're gonna be in big trouble. But also technically when you're speaking, what kinds of things should you be doing and not doing? And uh, David briefly overviewed some of them before, but we've uh, interviewed more than a dozen experts who have a lot of experience in speaking to different audiences. And the vast majority of those are not risk communicators. They are people like the people I'm looking at on the screen and it includes some of us including me who talked about how to deal with media, which is very interesting. And we also have a set of academic papers 
written more by academic people who essentially uh, talk about how this can be done better. So it's advice on planning communications and advice on implementing it when you're the one that has to be the implementer. And I'm hoping it's gonna be out in some summer 2022, I'm gonna say it's about 90% done. And that's, that's the short version, so. Thank you, Mike. So at this point, if there are any questions, we're happy to answer them. Thank you all. This has been uh, very helpful. Uh, one of the things that we've been discussing are models for how it is that DOE might manage the LOTOS program. This is an interesting model. So let me uh, uh, throw it open to the committee for questions. Um, but while we're waiting for the committee to uh, come up with questions, let me ask one. Um, you're sort of operating at arm's length from DOE, but you're funded by DOE. What, I guess, what's the magnitude of your funding and what does the funding portfolio, portfolio look like over, let's say 20 years, uh, since you come in every five years? Uh, is DOE managing you at a distance uh, in terms of the content of things that you study? Um, well, they've never said for us not to do a study that we felt strongly about. They often will come to them or they'll come to us with things that they think are higher priority or that we think are higher priority. And ultimately, it's a discussion as to what that portfolio looks like each year. And we review it each year, though there's ongoing discussion. Um, many of us are in contact with the leadership of, or senior management folks at DOE or at the sites. Uh, at least several times a month, if not more frequently, depending because of the range of it. At any given time, there are probably a dozen or so substantial projects going on. Uh, over the 20 years, I think our low point was about $3 million per year. Our high point was probably about seven, seven and a half million dollars in a year. And that, for example, when you take a look at the Amchika project, that was probably getting close to a $3 million project in and of itself. So it depends on the magnitude of what we're doing uh, and what's involved. Okay, thank you, uh, Rania. Thank you everyone for your presentations. Uh, one question to follow up on Joe, which was not my original question. Am I correct that funding for CRESP is earmarked from Congress? Yes and no. Um, <laughs> over the, the 25, 26 years that we've been in existence, I think three years it was earmarked. The rest of the time it has not been. Uh, so uh, they've had various funding mechanisms that they've used. Sometimes it's come out of headquarters budgets. Sometimes they have taxed the sites, the sites operating budgets to provide our support. It's been all over the place. Okay, thank you for that. So coming uh, to my uh, original question, um, how how has your work been affected based on the different priorities that the many different assistant uh, secretaries of VM have had over the years? Uh, I, I would think that some tend to use you more than others, tend to, tend to come to you for, with questions than other assistant secretaries. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship with the leadership? It, as you're correct, that some are more engaged than others uh, over time. Uh, depending on who the assistant secretary is, we've had very active engagement with the uh, assistant secretary, sometimes at higher levels, most frequently at uh, somebody that reports directly into the assistant secretary. For example, right now we're uh, reporting into the person that's uh, policy and uh, communications, though we interact with all the uh, principal deputy uh, secretaries and the like pretty routinely. Um, they, a lot of what we do has longer term perspectives. You know, we'll see things on the horizon and say, you know, this may be an issue that you're gonna be facing uh, five years from now, 10 years from now or longer. Can we start getting research going that will help you in that area? For example, one was just brought to us to start on is the movement of the graphite reactor cores on the river at Hanford and looking at what the risk profiles will be when they, have to move them uh, to the central plateau and how to get better estimates of what the release will be of carbon-14, of chlorine-36, et cetera, that are coming out of that. And what we're, uh, that's not an issue that they're gonna have to face for another 30 years. 
Why are we being asked now? Because they look at their overall risk budget for cleanup of the site, and they see that that has the potential to be a significant contributor, and they don't have the tools to deal with that right now. So they're asking us to participate in that. So it's very variable. But the fact that we have a portfolio of sometimes urgent things that they need, like the WIP example, and longer term things like we were talking about, or uh, like the Cementitious Barriers Partnership, that was, I don't know, six, seven years ago, but now it's coming to fruition with helping them at Savannah River and at Hanford uh, address issues that otherwise they wouldn't have been prepared for. Thank you. Thank you Simon? Yeah, thanks, Joe, and thanks for the presentations. I wonder, uh, given that CRESP, as I understand, is funded by DOE and presumably many of the stakeholders or some of the stakeholders you engage with, at least are not best disposed towards DOE, how do you sort of manage those relationships and balance them to make it work? Well, we, we take the same examples that you use. The National Academy studies are funded by the DOE. The state regulators are funded by DOE. Uh, they're all arm's length. It's the same sort of thing um, that we use as examples that many of the stakeholder groups, such as the site-specific advisory boards are funded by DOE. The difference is we're not under contract where they get to uh, control what we say. Okay, thanks. And you, you, sorry, you, you, you don't really encounter any problems with the credibility with some of the stakeholder groups? Um, some of them, the, the credibility depends on whether or not they uh, are welcoming to our message. I don't think it's an underlying issue of whether we're credible as individuals or an organization, but there certainly have been some uh, strong disagreements with some of the messages that we've related. Uh, okay. Mike can speak to some of that. So up fast. Okay, thank you very much. So just to ask that question a slightly different way, when, when you deal with your adversarial stakeholders, do they think of you as CRESP or think of you as DOE? Uh, as CRESP. Yeah. Okay, so so you're you're confident that your uh, disagreeing communities think that you're sufficiently independent from DOE to be trustworthy. I, I think so, um, and there have been places where we've publicly disagreed with DOE, mm -hmm. and DOE accepts that. And DOE has recognized that our independence is important for us to be helpful. Um, that and we're going to have disagreements or we're going to have recommendations that don't align, align with what they the directions they thought they were going. Uh, fortunately, there have been a number of times when our recommendations have caused them to change direction. So that's a positive impact from my perspective. Thank you. Shaheen, did you uh, have a question or? My question was answered. Thank you. I answered. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rania? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so David and others, who reviews whether CRESP is doing what it's meant to do? Um, how is membership of CRESP determined and what type of rotation method do you have? Okay, the membership of CRESP uh, depends on what our technical needs are. Uh, we have folks that have been from the original proposal when Bernie pulled that together. Mm -hmm. um, and given that that's coming on almost 30 years ago, uh, we're going through an intergenerational transfer with some of that at this point. Um, and basically it's been through the management board and myself as PI to reach out to identify folks that are of like mind. That being we're academics that want to do good science and engineering and research, but also have an impact and be strongly collaborative, multidisciplinary. That's not everyone, and it's certainly not a good place as a pre-tenure faculty member to be. So, David, a recent example is DOE reached out to us. They were looking for someone who really specializes in social media. And you can tell by my age that I don't specialize in social media. So we identified a, a tenured professor at Rutgers who's very, very good at social media, who has worked with the Defense Department, and now he's got he's going to be working with CRESPA social media issues for DOE. And, and, I think, and, and I think that's a very important thing to emphasize. The, the, the membership of CRESP has been very responsive to what the challenges of the environmental management program are at a given time. And those change and that 
that causes us to change the, the research membership of the, the Crest Management Board and the Crest researchers. The continuity and the independence of who's participating in CRESP and the flexibility there, I think has been essential to its success. And David, who reviews the work of CRESP, if any entity? Um, there, there have been reviews by DOE of what we do. We do an annual uh, uh, portfolio review with them. It's a little bit more formal where we present and they provide feedback and we have representation from headquarters and from the sites. Uh, there have been many times when we've been asked to present and provide uh, results of our studies to the Defense Board, to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, to the GAO. Thank you. And to the National Academies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bernie, this is all your fault. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually all Chuck Powers' fault. Um, but um, uh, let, let me. Uh, just emphasize a point that, that David said, but he said it almost in passing. I'm not sure we all caught it, which is he's only got senior people. Bernie, get a little closer to your microphone. He, he's only got senior people on that uh, on CRESP. Yeah. When we formed CRESP, we were cognizant of the fact that we are likely to be biased by working for with DOE and these funding. And to me, my greatest vulnerability was to have junior faculty whose careers were at stake. And now suddenly, if I tell truth to power, um, we're going to lose the Crest money and their careers are going to be at risk. And so we avoided, uh, not all of us, I mean, the folks at the University of Washington had some junior faculty, but in New Jersey, our group had only had faculty who had their own NIH grants or other grants and who could survive losing the Crest money. So we could always tell truth to power. Interesting. Other comments from the um, committee? Well, I'll just ask one, one further question then, and that is um, how do, do you feel the DOE as an institution is nurturing the CRISP program. In other words, uh, are they are they serious about maintaining, expanding, et cetera, the enterprise, or is this uh, not a labor of love for them? Um, I think so, and I think you know it is always. Keep in mind, DOE has a lot of turnover. Um, also in its political leadership and its uh, senior management, as political leadership changes, there always tends to be a reorganization. There's a whole history, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Um, so it's always a re-education process, but the fact that we've been supported this long and we have very good and frequent engagement with a lot of folks there uh, at the sites, at headquarters, and they respect what we say, yeah, I think they're nurturing of it. The level of interaction support can vary from year to year and from individual to individual. And DOE is going through a generational change right now at EM. And it's going to be another re-education and challenging process, I believe, for the next couple of years. Thank you. Rania? Can I answer that question in a slightly sure. different way? Um, if, uh, if DOE wasn't happy with CREST's overall accomplishments, I think it would have done what it has, what federal agencies often do is get angry. Congress would have pulled the money and it would have ended up going to their state schools of public health and schools of arts and sciences of the particular elected officials who were on that committee. And that hasn't happened. So I think they must be satisfied with what we're giving them, even if they don't always agree with it. And when they don't agree, they tell you. They're not bashful about it. Thank you. Rania? Uh, what are your views about DOE EM using the Office of Science to address some of its scientific challenges related to cleanup? My understanding is that maybe in the mid 90s, they had stronger relationships, but it's not the case anymore. And that includes the LODOS program, but other 
um, Office of Science capabilities as well? I think it's been variable and it's been leadership driven. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also somewhat personality driven. Uh, so it's leadership both at the Office of Science and at EM and above them and how that's organized. So as I said, it's been variable. Uh, there have been some very good things that have come out of the Office of Science. So uh, supporting EM. Thank you. Well, what about today, oh. David? Sorry, what about today? <laughs> well, there are still things that the Office of Science does that is very helpful in supporting EM. Part of the problem is the, and there have been reports and studies on this, that overall the science base and the technology or the research uh, development and demonstration base for EM is woefully underfunded. Um, and when you look at the magnitude of their program, it's about $7 billion a year. And you look at, look at it relative to any other uh, organization that's looking forward for at least another 30, 40 years of operations, uh, they're woefully underfunded in that area. Thank you. That Simon? was one of the recommendations we made in the omnibus report that they needed to do more in that area. And there was a, a Secretary of Energy's committee that I served on a few years ago. Um, and uh, that report made the same point, probably a, a little bit more artfully of uh, in detail of what level should be in what areas, but uh, mm -hmm. that includes relationship with Office of Science. Thank you. Simon? Yeah, okay, thanks. Just a, really a clarification for my own um, um, uh, assistance, because I don't understand the US system so well. So are you, under, are you funded by the DOE Office for um, Environmental Management? Is that the name? Yes. Um, so you're separate from the Office of Science, yeah. Okay, that's it, thank you. The sites actually report to that office, uh, but the sites also get direct uh, congressional allocations uh, in the annual federal budget, and EM gets some and that it gets divided out. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other last questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, well, thank you. Thank you all very much for a great presentation. You've given us a lot to think about here and we appreciate your taking the time to do it. It's been very helpful. Yeah. Thanks again for inviting us. Yeah. So with that, uh, I think we're going to conclude the uh, presentations and move into the uh, uh, public comment session. Uh, we have about uh, 20 minutes uh, set aside for this. If you uh, uh, are not one of the committee members and uh, have um, material that you would like to bring to the attention of the uh, group here, now's the time. Again, we would uh, appreciate the uh, you know, your being brief to the extent of uh, limiting comments to about uh, five minutes. Uh, just keep in mind that uh, we're likely going to have another uh, public session sometime in January, uh, and there will be additional opportunity to uh, comment then if you don't have an opportunity to uh, comment now. Uh, the, the details of that will be uh, announced uh, on the uh, Academy's uh, website and listserv, uh, so you can pay attention to that if uh, you don't get your uh, voice heard today. But uh, for now, uh, if there are members of the public who would like to uh, make statements, uh, about what you've heard today or uh, in previous meetings, uh, please raise your hand. Yes, Diane. Did you, you call on me? Yes, I did. Okay, let me just get my statement. I wanna keep it short. Um, one second here. So, uh, oops, get this open. Um, couple of things. Um, one is uh, following up on what we feel is unanswered um, questions about the credibility of, of this committee still that really have not been answered. Um, 13 organizations sent a letter uh, in July with several specific questions and then follow up questions in a September letter specifically asking who at the academy concluded that no need, no changes needed to be made to the committee, who was involved in the reviews of the concerns. Um, we ask specifically, did staff or officials of the academy consult with or discuss with DOE and relevant congressional committees on the selection of the committee? Um, and in establishing 
the low dose committee, did the academies consult with, solicit, receive comments, or otherwise give DOE the chance to influence or the congressional committee members the chance to uh, suggest um, the prospective members of the committee and, and so forth. So, so you have those letters. And then we got a response from Dr. Ferguson, which basically did not answer those questions. His, the extent of his response was that the Academy invites, and I'm quoting, anyone who's interested in providing nominations for committee service, including self-nominations to do so. The decision on who serves on a National Academies Committee rests solely with the Academies. And then after the statement of task is agreed on, committees maintain an arm's length relationship with the study sponsor in order to preserve their independence. And sponsors may offer suggestions, but do not select committee members. So that's how he answered the specific questions. Then when I raised this at our last public comment period, um, Dr. Costi said, uh, and I believe uh, said she, she said that um, in his letter, he was clear that DOE and no offices of DOE had a role in uh, the makeup of the committee, but that is not what his letter said. So that's different. What we heard verbally and what we got in writing were not the same. And so I don't feel like we've gotten a specific answer to that question. It does leave me with no alternative but to do a FOIA request to the DOE for all of the interactions with this committee. And of course, we know that takes a long time to get an answer, but that, that's what we're going to have to do. Um, so I wanted to lay out this continuing concern, um, which was raised by over a dozen groups that closely track uh, radiation issues and uh, the National Academies uh, efforts. Um, also, I was disturbed, so that, that's that issue, um, uh, was disturbing to hear um, the chairman, you saying, uh, asking questions about how to um, really basically supporting the idea of hormesis. Um, that, that, it's not supposed to be the goal of the committee, and perhaps it's not a, a direct one, but it, it raises the question of, of if that isn't what, what this is about. And we've, we've suggested that's our concern, uh, so that, that was distressing. Um, finally, CRESP does not appear to have any stakeholder participation in what it does, or at least that's, it wasn't described in the presentations. So um, it's, it's hard to say if they're were stakeholders that were happy or unhappy, uh, public participants, I mean. I, I take it back. Not stakeholder, but community and public residents, um, that um, class of participant. Uh, that, so that uh, we're continuing to watch what's happening and, uh, again, raise support for the um, presentations that took place uh, the second last time around with the community folks and the uh, arguments that Dr. Marcajani made about having um, people who are impacted, community people, um, considered respectfully on a par with the scientific experts and, and to have uh, more, um, to, to share more power with them over the studies that are done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll leave it to uh, Rania to uh, comment about the interactions with the uh, Academy directly in the context of, of the uh, letter, but there is one important point that I want to make here, and that is all of the materials that this committee receives, uh, either in public or in writing or in any form, uh, are made publicly available. Uh, via the Academy's website. So if you want to know what it is that the, the committee is seeing in the way of input from any, any group, uh, it is available. So Rania, you may want to um, um, comment. Sure, maybe I can uh, repeat again for the record the statement that I made that I think it was two public meetings ago. Yeah. And uh, in my view, at least, does not contradict what is in the letter uh, from Charles Ferguson to the group is that the Department of Energy's Office of Science had no role 
in any decisions about who serves on the committee. And uh, no doubt the four-year request is uh, something that all of us have the right to do, to get the information that we need from the government. Um, and if there is a role for me, somebody will tell me from the government and I will of course comply. Um, um, I, uh, the request so goes what to DOE, not to the academy. what you're saying is that, that the DOE did not play a role, but that is not what his letter says. I mean, when you're saying that his letter says that, I read exactly what his letter said, and it didn't say that. It said, here's our usual process. Here's what happens. It, do, it did not answer who looked at this. Did DOE have a role? And you've taken one of the agencies within DOE and said that this department had no role, and you're saying that that's what his letter says. But his letter doesn't say that, so we don't have it in writing. And it's just, uh, you know, I'm... Uh, I waited until the transcript was uh, played, till the video came out, so that I could compare what you said to the letter that we got from Ferguson. And his letter is what I read to you. It's very general, and it does not answer any of our five questions. Now, you're answering it here, and so I guess we've got that on record, but it's not what we got as an official response from Dr. Ferguson. Okay, I'm going to let Rania take this one offline uh, with you and uh, continue the dialogue with the academies. So I don't think that this committee can do The reason anything. I'm bringing it up here, I know it sounds picky, is that I think the panel needs to know that there's a concern about the legitimacy here, and this is at the root of it. So I don't mean to take unnecessary time from important work, but if you want credibility, then it would be good to resolve these issues officially. We are, we are so apprised. Uh, are there any other um, comments? Uh, Amy? Anne Cronenberg? You may be muted. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to go back to the presentation from the uh, press folks this afternoon. And I have a, my question is directed to the concept of only having very senior people involved in the work of the um, it's of, of the group however you want to I call it consor consortium I can understand some of the advantages but I would have liked someone to discuss the disadvantages of not including junior folks um, in such an enterprise because there is the risk risk as I see it, it's a twofold risk one is, that uh, the opportunity to bring new people uh, forward into this field, which is not going to go away uh, with the next report, right? There, there will be a need for uh, a pipeline of educated uh, people who can contribute in these areas. But also sometimes the more senior people don't have the same skill sets to bring to certain problems that, uh, that those of us who are a little longer in the tooth um, may have. So I would like to hear some discussion on that point or, or leave it to your committee, Joe, to, 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 to mull that over. Because I think that the, uh, we, we already are aware that there's a dwindling um, supply, if you will, of the next generation of radiation researchers. And uh, this is an opportunity for new people to be brought into the field also. Uh, point taken, uh, Amy. It uh, looks like uh, Bernie's willing to have a go at, uh, at this one. Uh, Amy, your, point, your, your, your points are excellent. Um, the, uh, I, I basically was talking to the issue of what, was, what would be um, uh, a way of dealing with Department of Energy if you were a faculty member. Um, and my concern as the leader of the program was that I very much care about the young investigators. So what I meant really was that young investigators were not funded through CRESP, but they certainly participated. There were lots of funding that we had for young investigators in our program. These were successful programs, the ones at the University of Washington and at Rutgers that were, were part of it originally. And we had lots of funding for young investigators and very much would involve them in CRESP. But I didn't wanna be in a situation where their primary funding came from CRESP 
uh, their salaries came from CRESP. So that now we've got to make a decision as to whether we knuckle under the DOE. And we were prepared from the very beginning to walk away from CRESP. I, I consider it a miracle that it stayed around these many years, given all the uh, times that CRESP has said negative things to the Department of Energy. And has, we believe, told the truth to power. Uh, and let me make a, just a quick comment about the, uh, the, the stakeholders. Everything CREST does has, has, a, has a community involvement in it, uh, at least when, when I was running it. Uh, we did not have a community stakeholder group for CREST because we were working completely around the country and there was no way that you would be able to do that. But what we focused on, our decision was to do it, to do it locally and to make sure we had local uh, community stakeholders involved, not some folks from some national organization headquartered in Washington. Thanks, Bernie. And, and Amy, uh, to the extent that we're using CRESP as a, uh, uh, one of the models that is being considered uh, for how it is that we would run, run a, or somebody would run a Lotus uh, radiation research program, uh, we're, we're certainly attentive to the fact that uh, we're going to have to have uh, the younger generation uh, incentivized to participate in the enterprise. So that, that's certainly high, high on our discussion agenda. I'm happy to hear that. Thanks. Are there any other uh, comments from the uh, public uh, non-committee members? <laughs> okay, well, hearing none, uh, thank you all for your uh, participation today and for the attendance at the meeting. And uh, uh, at this point, we are going to uh, uh, close the public session uh, and we'll go into private session uh, beginning uh, in about, uh, Let's see. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. We'll have a, we'll have a 30, 30 minute break at this point. Oh. Okay. Well, thank you all. Uh, we'll be back at um, um, 445.